reality is the economy is weakening. It's probably going to weaken further. We're still in this race between a peak in inflation and what will probably be a mild recession. The Federal Reserve is unlikely to be kind to the equity market. If we see weakness in the labor market, how will the Fed's communication evolve? The market is basically pricing in a Fed put. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down three quarters of 1% on the S&P. TK, the main event, is in Taiwan. It is. We switched to international relations. It's really being dominant. We'll get to the markets. Great that Liz Ann Saunders with us on the equity markets. And Mike, am I right, John? Mike Wilson's with us later? Mike Wilson in a few hours' time. But right now, it is about Speaker Pelosi and the history to be made uh, in Taiwan. The reach here John, from 1997 to where we are now, absolutely stunning. The White House came to point out, Tom, that Congress is an independent <clears throat> branch of government. I'm not sure that the Chinese quite see it that way this morning. I would say not. There's many, many ways to cut this and a lot of reading to be had about what's different and the tensions in that. But what it does come down to, John, is the ability to make a mistake. When I talk to military experts, whether it's General Kimmett, General Hodges, as we do with Admiral Stravitas, they're always talking about you get yourself set up where you can make an itty-bitty mistake. It's sort of like Bloomberg surveillance in that regard. We make a ton of mistakes, Tom, we do. on a daily basis. Let's hope, Lisa, that the Chinese <clears throat> government does not make a mistake when they are set to respond to a visit that we all anticipate is going to happen Everyone, in the next couple of hours. Yeah, and everyone's trying to figure out what the response could potentially be. And in the market, there seems to be a feeling this is risk off. This is having a pretty significant market ramification, at least when you look at the 10-year yields going in to about 2.5% and people projecting it could fall further. How much, though, are people perhaps looking past some of the longer-term implications of the fissure between China and the U.S.? This is structurally inflationary, and a lot of people are looking at how the Fed responds to that. So, Lisa, we've got that headline risk hovering over this market, weighing on sentiment through much of today. You've also got the data and the Fed speak, which, let's face it, that's what we've been trading on over the last week, ever since Chairman Powell spoke last Wednesday. How do they deal with this new uh, potential risk? Usually risk off or this idea that there could be some geopolitical tensions would lead to an easing in Fed policy. This time, how much does it exacerbate inflationary tensions, exacerbate some of the inputs that are causing uh, some of the constraints in supplies at the same time that the data isn't rolling over quickly enough to justify the dovish pivot that many people are pricing in. We've got some risk aversion right now. Here's your price action. We're down three quarters of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down one full percentage point. As Lisa pointed out, yields in again. We're down three basis points on a 10-year to 254.45. Bear in mind that in the middle of June, we were close to 350. That is a monster turnaround on a 10-year. Tom, in foreign exchange, euro dollar 102.36. We're negative a quarter of one percent there. Dolly yen getting back to 130, Tom. That's five days yeah. of yen strength. Let's talk about Jordan Rochester at Nomura with a real change here. And this is some of the nuances going on now as people not recalibrate, but maybe John reset off of all the caution that's out there. He has euro dollars, still does, and he's looking for weaker euro. But he says now because of the U.S. upset, switch over to euro yen, looking for stronger yen, weaker euro. The target 125 on euro yen. Lisa, the That's story move. clear there. If you want to sell the euro, Nomura is saying do it against the Japanese yen. It is fascinating how quickly things are changing as people take a look at where the strength is. And John, you were saying we do get data today, and I am actually uh, really trained on this. At 10 a.m., we get U.S. June jolts data, the job openings data. We saw it peak out uh, a couple of months ago. It is still well above 11 million job openings out there, uh, which exceeds the number of potential available workers. How much does that come down? What does that mean about how tight this labor market is and how does that factor into a Fed that has seemingly backed away? But have they really? I mean, we can get into the whole thing about what Fed Chair Jay Powell actually said and what, how the market interpreted it. But the market cannot interpret a strong labor market as anything other than giving the Fed all the impetus to really move ahead with a uh, strengthening and tightening policy. Today, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to arrive in Taiwan. The expectation is around 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. What is the Chinese response? She 
She is the first House Speaker to visit this, uh, this uh, territory in 25 years. How much does this really ignite an immediate response from China versus a longer-term breach in the relationship between China and the U.S.? And today, there's loads of Fed speak. Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, as well as uh, St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. How much do they talk about the easing in financial conditions and push back against that, John, at a time when you're getting back to zero real yields on the 10-year? Mm -hmm. Remember, that real yield getting positive was what spurred the sell-off, some people say, in yeah. risk assets, and we've gone full circle here. There's a lot to talk about in this bond market, and we'll do that through the program. Lisa, thank you. Looking ahead to that data and all the Fed speak as well. Looking ahead, potentially in the next couple of hours, the Speaker Pelosi landing in Taiwan, the highest-ranking U.S. official to land there in some 25 years. Tom, I believe it was 1997 in Newt Gingrich. That's how far back <clears throat> you've got to go. It's really interesting here to see the domestic politics and, of course, what we saw in 1994 with the revolution that some would say uh, Gingrich of Georgia led. But, John, it was a Republican moment then, and here is the arch-Democrat of Baltimore and San Francisco affecting a policy with what I would suggest is hugely quiet, vigorous Republican support. We understand, Fascinating Tom, tensions. that the U.S. leader told Xi on a call during that exchange last week that, quote, Congress is an independent branch of government and the Speaker makes her own decisions. This is what we heard from the spokeswoman for the Chinese Foreign Ministry earlier today when the House Speaker, being the third highest ranking figure in the U.S. government, flies on a U.S. military plane to make a provocative visit to the Taiwan region. It is certainly not unofficial behavior. We're going to guide you through the headlines as they come in through the next couple of hours. We're going to guide you through this market too. We'll do that with Thanos Van Vakidis, Global Head of G10 FX Strategy at Bank of America. Thanos, I was going through your calls and there it was, bearish on the Chinese currency. Thanos, walk me through as to why. Well, the Chinese economy has been weak. Uh, policies have been easing. This is the only country that has not learned how to live with uh, COVID. And the stimulus in these conditions is not as effective. And part of the stimulus actually has to be a weaker currency. So adding everything together, I believe that there is further weakness in CNY. EMFX more broadly is under pressure. Uh, we have seen selling from positioning that is not short yet. Uh, so from this point of view, we also expect more weakness in the MFX more broadly. Thanos, there are some highly speculative conversations taking place right now over Speaker Pelosi's potential visit to Taiwan and how China might respond to it. We've said on this program over the last week that you have to remain focused still on what's happening domestically in that economy. Thanos, can you tell us how bad are things right now in the Chinese economy? Well, uh, definitely growth numbers are well below what we have seen uh, historically. And uh, uh, even when the rest of the world was recovering, uh, opening up after the pandemic, the Chinese economy was weakening. There are also problems in the real estate sector where investment has been a key engine of growth uh, in the past. And uh, also trade tensions with the West for an economy like China that has been very much export dependent in the past adds to a relatively weak economic outlook. But to me, the most important is that until China finds a way out from COVID, it is hard to become positive on economic growth. Thanos, taking a step back, uh, there is a question of if there is an escalating issue between the U.S. and China, escalating tensions after this visit to Taiwan by Nancy Pelosi, how long can the dollar remain the haven currency if it is also the epicenter of this potential ratcheting up in tensions? I mean, definitely if we see risk off because of uh, uh, this kind of geopolitical risk that we're seeing this week, the dollar in theory should strengthen. But the market also believes that this uh, could lead to a less hawkish, more dovish uh, Fed. This is where I think the market is wrong. And even before the development this week in China, the dollar has been weakening, uh, yields have been falling, with the market expecting a dovish uh, pivot by the Fed. I completely disagree with this. The Fed is focusing on inflation. Inflation is still rising. The labor market in the U.S. is still very strong. We need the U.S. economy to weaken for inflation to come down, and we need inflation to be well on its way down for the U.S. to start thinking being less hawkish. 
market pricing rate cuts by the Fed the next year make absolutely no sense. Thanos, I'm going to add your name to the long list of names I've got who completely <laughs> disagree with what happened last week. Thanos, thank you. Thanos Van Vakidis of Bank of America. In response to That's what's happened true. last week, we've got some dollar weakness, and what you're seeing is some yen strength. So you've got some risk aversion, Tom, accompanied with lower yields, not higher yields. That's a big change. So what do you see yen strength? We're back down to 130. 130 well, yeah. on dollar yen, Tom. That's a major change from yeah. five days ago. A five-day rally. We've, it's a five-day rally, and it's a shift there. And on the screen, there's some correlation. But I would look at the yield space. And, John, to wake up this morning uh, after, you know, after the three-hour sleep and, and, and noticing that the 10-year real yield almost went to zero and negative. It got to a 0 0.02. Right now, four basis points make it five basis points off the zero mark. That really indicates the shift back to the unimaginable negative real yields. There's a lot of little things going on in the yes, bond market yes, right now. Yes, that's precisely right. Lisa, I know you're looking at the yield curve two's tens. You can take a look at the three month versus the 10 year. What is it now? Four or five basis points? Yeah. Positive, well, just about? It's just about positive. The trajectory of how quickly it has collapsed is just dramatic. Oh. It is historic mm. in how quickly it's collapsed. The reason why this yield curve is interesting is because it's the one that the Fed has pointed to to say, don't look at the 210 spread. Yeah, sure, it's inverted. Yeah, sure, it's the most inverted since 2000. But I'm really, we're really looking at the three-month 10-year. Well, that's collapsed, too. So they can't ignore that anymore. But those inflation pressures, Tom, still there. And the velocity is there, John, I mean, I just did what's called a fitted standard deviation study. This is a fancy mumbo jumbo on the Bloomberg, John. And we've gone from plus 3.6 standard deviations on June 13th to a negative 2 point whatever. It's a 5.8 standard deviation swing in the 10 year yield. That shows the velocity right now. It's too early for that kind of stuff, Tom. <clears throat> it's never it's too just, early. It's just for, too early you know, for it's it. never, Come on. Fitted log studies are always something you can do. And John Kirby's trying to keep everyone calm. The National Security Council spokesperson said this in a news conference yesterday. Put simply, there is no reason for Beijing to turn a potential visit consistent yeah. with long-standing U.S. policy into some <clears throat> sort of crisis Let's talk about or that. conflict. Let's have that conversation up next and later in the next hour. Mandy Zook of Credit Suisse on this equity market rip-roaring rally of the last few weeks. This morning, slightly negative, down eight-tenths of one percent. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to land in Taiwan in a few hours, defying Chinese threats of military action. The trip will make Pelosi the highest-ranking American politician to visit there in 25 years. China regards Taiwan as part of its territory. It has vowed an unspecified military response to a Pelosi visit. President Biden says a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan has killed one of the planners of the 9-11 attacks. Ayman al-Zawahari was the leader of al-Qaeda. According to a senior administration official, the drone attack had been planned for weeks. Zawahiri was in a house in Kabul and was said to have been killed when he stood out on a balcony. The U.S. is sending Ukraine another arms package valued at $550 million. It includes a more ammunition for an advanced rocket system that was sent earlier, as well as 75,000 artillery shells. The Pentagon says the U.S. has sent roughly $8.8 billion in military aid to Ukraine since the start of the Biden administration. And in the UK, Liz Truss vows to cut waste, bureaucracy and inefficiency in the civil service if she becomes Prime Minister. Truss is the front runner in the race with Rishi Sunak to succeed Boris Johnson. She says she can save taxpayers billions of pounds a year by altering pay scales and slashing holiday allowances. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. season is here. Everything yes. I've read has yes. just got the R word. Resilience, not recession. Earnings are expected to be so weak that I think that presents a very intriguing opportunity. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. We get a deluge of earnings globally this week from Alphabet and Microsoft. With exclusive expert analysis. These earnings have proved to be really inconsistent, not actually showing a real picture that goes one way or another. Bloomberg Television and Radio, the fastest numbers and analysis you trust. There's no reason for the Chinese to use 
uh, a potential visit by the Speaker of House as some sort of pretext to escalate tensions higher than they already are. And I would remind you that in recent days and weeks, it is the Chinese side uh, that has, through their rhetoric uh, and their activities, including this live fire exercise, the ones that are escalating the tensions. Good to hear from John Kirby yesterday, the National Security Council spokesperson from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane <laughs> and Lisa Brambert. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Here's the risk-off tone dominating this market right now. It looks a little something like this. Futures down 8 or 9 cents of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq down by more than one full percentage points. Treasuries rally and yields lower by 3 or 4 basis points to 250-356. This is just such a massive turnaround from where we were in the middle of June where we were pushing 350 on a 10-year, much, much lower since then. Crude lower too, Tom, by a little more than 1%, 92.70 yeah. on WTI. And that swing for global Wall Street, almost six standard deviations on the 10-year yield. That's a fitted study there. It's a fancy thing you can do. But you're right, John. I think the CFA phrase, John, is ginormous. Ginormous. Ginormous Huge. moves. In Monster the moves, TK. Uh, market uh, as well. We'll talk about the Apple transaction yesterday. That was ginormous as well. Always ginormous on what's going on inside the Beltway. Joseph Matthew joins us now. Uh, in Washington with his muscles and sound on, on Bloomberg uh, Radio uh, Worldwide. Joe Matthew, David Sachs in Foreign Affairs Magazine does a phenomenal summary as we stagger with China and Taiwan over 30 years. And he doesn't mince words. He says there has been a rhetorical shift in Washington, starting with President Trump. You know, it's not a certitude, but he puts yep. it with Pompeo and Trump. Is Biden and Speaker Pelosi simply following on from the work that Trump and Pompeo laid? Well, they probably don't like that wording, but it is essentially the reality, right? That goes for tariffs as well. This is largely uh, the same relationship here. And boy, what deliberate language coming from the White House yesterday. A lot different than what we heard from Joe Biden two weeks ago. That column opens with those remarks when the president said the military doesn't think it's a good idea right now. If he hadn't said that, this would be a very different conversation. It strikes me at the moment. Everyone's looking back to 1997 and Newt Gingrich. That's been 25 years, right, since a Speaker of the House touched down in Taiwan. But Beijing isn't looking at 97. Tom, they're looking at 91, <clears throat> which is when the Chinese police, Beijing police, chased Nancy Pelosi and some other lawmakers out of Tiananmen Square when she unfurled a pro-democracy banner. There are questions about whether she will make a statement like that or if this is going to be, you know, something where we see photographs hours after right. uh, her visit, but that has yet to be determined. Completely unfair, but Joe, it's unfair Tuesday, so let's go with it. President Xi has said he's looking for a great rejuvenation by 2049. This is something that Elizabeth economy has really honed at the Council on Foreign Relations. Do we have a plan out to 2049? With regard to China? I don't know if that's true. To be honest with you, we don't even know what we're going to do with the tariffs uh, in China next week, and we've been waiting for word on that. This is a, such a fast evolving relationship here that I'm not sure the White House would have a direct answer on that. I, look, there's a lot of planning that goes behind uh, any geopolitical matter, certainly the second largest economy in the world. But to visualize where we're going to be then, Tom, I'm not sure that there's an answer at 1600. Joe, I want to pick up on something that you said. The, in late July, uh, Joe Biden said that the military thinks it's not a good idea for Nancy Pelosi to go to Taiwan, and that that yeah. really is the reason why we're all talking about this. How much is it Joe Biden's reluctant, reluctance to sign off on this publicly, and how much is it a, a rhetoric change from China, a hardening in the stance, the buildup in Air Force and the potential air raids uh, that they've been conducting in the region? How much has that been the change? Well, it's hard to tell uh, because, you know, we had the live fire drills uh, two nights ago, and it's a question about what exactly China is going to do. Was this about the preamble or will there actually be a concerted response? You know, if they if they succeeded in scaring Nancy Pelosi from going to Taiwan or somehow convinced the White House to talk her out of it, this would be a very different story uh, this morning. It, you know, it's it seems clear that she has no really no opportunity but to go through with the trip. So, you know, is this the confrontation now or will there be something even days later you know John Kirby when we spoke with him yesterday talked about the possibility of a missile test maybe they drop a few missiles in the ocean maybe there's a a large scale incursion upon Taiwan's airspace or at least you know getting closer to flying over the island all of those would be very bold moves if we saw that in the next couple of days and it's Something that the Pentagon is prepared for. We have to remember, Joe Biden says, hey, we can't tell Nancy Pelosi what to do. We're going to be figuring this out just like everybody else. But 
it takes the administration to get her there. She's flying an Air Force plane and will have likely escorts from the Pentagon. General Milley, the chair of the Joint Chiefs, said they will get her in and out safely no matter what. Joe, uh, this particular president has made a real big point in trying to coalesce his allies around some sort of center to reunify uh, NATO, et cetera. How much support does the United States have from its allies in this move of Nancy Pelosi that perhaps hasn't been endorsed but certainly is being supported uh, by the nation. Well, and and of course, the region is is a, a greater question here. You know, if we're if we're on, on the the cusp of creating a NATO for Southeast Asia, this is what's going to prompt it. I asked Mark Esper yesterday, the former Defense Secretary, if this would be tantamount to an Article Five uh, a violation for NATO if China, in fact, did uh, go into Taiwan. And it's not at that level yet, but Lisa, it's getting close. Joe Matthew. Down at DC, Joe, we'll catch up in the next hour on an important event set to take place in the next couple of hours. Tom, I think the White House has been pretty consistent about this. When it comes to Taiwan independence, they'll say we don't support it, but they do not say they oppose it. And when it comes to Speaker Pelosi's trip, they're not coming out and saying we support it, but they're also not coming out and say we oppose it. Um, I think that's a pretty consistent stance on a range of issues from this White House on this particular topic. It shifted a couple of years ago, John. This was stuff that was unspoken for years and years and years, and it shifted certainly with the catalyst of President Trump and Secretary of State uh, Pompeo, and it's carried forward here in its own unique Biden manner. So here we are, and what we've got is one aircraft carrier hung off Taiwan somewhere, I believe, north of Luzon in the Philippines, the USS Ronald Reagan with its uh, complement of ships. I think it's a little bit too simplistic, Tom, just to blame the former administration for the shift. The hawkish rhetoric coming out of the Xi administration has been absolutely. massive. No, absolutely. And that's it's the big change from spring, too. Massive. Let's not miss this. Back in spring, yes, we heard some complaints, but nothing like this. Tom, nothing like this. Well, I, I would say in the last four or five years, and, and again, I mentioned Dr. Economy at CFR where they're mustery the third revolution. There is a third revolution in China, and that links in with the change in rhetoric that we saw from uh, Mr. Trump. There are problems at home. Elisa, we've talked about it. The weakness in the economy, <clears throat> the instability, the potential social unrest around the mortgage problems too. And how much was this a planned move that was delayed by the pandemic? There certainly has been a buildup in troops. It's not just a change in rhetoric, but it's also a buildup in military activity by China in Taiwan and around there. Down eight tenths of one percent on the S&P from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Too complacent, too soon, fading recession risk. That's the take from Goldman Sachs this morning. I'll build on that a little bit later. If you're looking for recession risk, look for the data a little bit later. Job openings in America could come down, and maybe that's what this Fed wants to see. We can discuss job openings in America, too, alongside the Fed speak through today. Futures, negative eight-tenths of 1% on the S&P. The Nasdaq down by more than one full percentage point. By this point, you know the story. Hanging over this market, headline risk in Taiwan. So just a little bit of weakness, risk off, risk aversion. You see it in the bond market, too. Yields lower again on a 10-year. Down three basis points to 253.92. Think about where we've been. Close to 350 in the middle of June, then all the way back in to 253.74. And the spread between twos and tens inverted. You know that story. Lisa, inverted by the most since when? The early 2000s. It's been a long, long time since we've seen this levels. And only getting more inverted, which is problematic for people who see this rebound as having some staying power, considering that this does not historically track. Typically, you don't see a deepening in the inversion <clears throat> before a sustained rally, and it's causing some jitters, but not enough in the market. Yields in as well on a two-year by a couple of basis points. So this is five days of yields declining. And five days also of Japanese yen strength. So risk aversion accompanied with lower yields gives some life to that yen strength story. It's working in a way it hasn't worked all year. We've come down from 139 from the middle of July down to about 130.87 right now. And Tom, I go back to that story from Jordan Rochester over in Nomura that you mentioned. He still does not like the euro. He just thinks maybe play it against the yen instead. So euro yen yeah, well. right now, 133.95, and he's looking for a move 
back towards 125. This is just interest rate dynamics, John, and it's central banks catching up with Chairman uh, Powell. It is Chairman Powell catching up with himself and moving forward to September. And indeed, what we're not talking about is a November rate move. So I think these dynamics, the interest rate dynamics, is what's driving the foreign exchange right now. And some at the same time, we've yeah. got a lot of people a long, long <clears throat> list of people pushing back against the dovish interpretation of right. Chairman Powell last week. Very good. Let's get to it. The earnings hallmark for the day is out moments ago. Caterpillar with a very nice beat. They cite uh, Caterpillar cites favorable price realization and higher sales volumes. That is a perfect entree to Lizanne Saunders, chief investment strategist at Charles Schwab, who does follow revenue and earnings. I am fascinated, Lizanne, by what I'm observing which is the macro story, the Fed story, the big picture story is absolutely overwhelming. Earnings are coming in pretty well and, and revenues, too. Do revenues and earnings matter anymore? Uh, they, they do. And, and, you know, us included a thought that we might see a little bit more weakness start to creep in. You've seen it more in the outlooks, more in the forward-looking commentary, um, both on the revenue side and the profit margin side, but it hasn't manifested itself in terms of things like the beat rate and uh, deterioration in earnings for the second quarter. I still think that that's a second half of the year uh, story, especially given commentary. And if you look at forward profit margin estimates, even though they're not as robust as earnings estimates, those have uh, rolled over. So I think maybe this just gets pushed a little bit later in the year, the deterioration that I do think is coming. Do you see corporations adjusting or are they adjusting like we're all adjusting to the day-to-day -day macro analysis that we're all doing? Well, it depends on who the corporation is, whether you're on the good side of the economy, the services side of the economy, if it's the good side, were you a direct play into the stay at home environment? And I think uh, it's probably not a stretch to say that's that's a bubble that's in the process of bursting right now. So I think what's unique about this environment is often we, we talk about the consumer side of the economy, the investment side of the economy as the relevant comps. Now it's the goods side versus the service side. And even within goods, there's that pandemic beneficiary versus other areas. And I also think anything tied to housing is going to be increasingly important to watch given the weakness we're seeing in housing and the feeder that has into certain segments of the uh, good side of the economy. Lizanne, the bulls out there will say, and they'll push back, uh, saying that you're starting to see inflation cool off, that there are a lot of places where it is on the decline, particularly in the energy sector, but also on the margins in certain regions with housing prices and even rents. What's your pushback to that, this idea that that will give enough uh, of a reason to the Federal Reserve for this dovish pivot that a lot of people are buying into? So I don't have any pushback on the leading indicators of inflation, uh, to your point. You, you've seen it in supplier deliveries. You've seen it in prices paid. You've seen it in, I, I tweeted out a chart today of the you know, number of commodities moving up in price versus down in price. And that's converging in a way that suggests an improving inflation environment. I, I think maybe what we missed, and I really emphasize maybe because I'm not inside the heads of the Fed, that given their emphasis on wanting to see a series of lower readings on inflation, I think they learned some of the lessons of sort of the fits and starts that preceded when, when Volcker really had to get aggressive, is I, I think they want to be really cautious about pivoting um, too soon. Uh, I, I do still think there's probably going to be a fairly narrow window between the final rate hike, whenever that is, and the first rate cut. But it may not be as imminent as what I think this rally uh, was somewhat on the basis of. Lizanne, how much conviction do you have? Are you actually actively leaning against the rally that we've seen so far uh, in equities, or are you just sort of taking a pause and waiting and seeing? So I think the what we've been telling our investors is that the, the rally that we've seen down the quality spectrum, that is probably a component of the rally you want to fade. And, but there is some improving uh, breadth. You still have a very anemic percentage of stocks trading at new highs, but you have seen an improvement in breadth, not 
quite the thrusty kind of breath environment that you would like to see. So I think it's more of a bifurcation. Maybe you can sort of lean into this on the quality end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. but I'd lean out of it uh, down the quality well, spectrum. I don't think this is an environment <clears throat> where the junky stuff will continue to uh, move higher. Listen, I don't want to get in trouble with your compliance and general counsel, but let's do it this morning. Why not? And that would be, <laughs> are you suggesting that a vanilla index fund isn't the way to go? A proxy for the Standard & Poor's 500? a proxy for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and that you need to really get more sector-specific towards service, towards quality? First of all, I think, and we've always said that a mix of, of passive and active probably makes sense. and also depends on who you are as an investor and what your goals are. However, it, it, for those that are more stock picking oriented that do want to take an active approach. We've actually been leaning away from sector-based decisions and leaning much more into factor-based decisions. I think that factor approach, investing based on characteristics, not putting blinders on in terms of where you look for those characteristics, I think that has been the way to go and will continue to be the way to go. And you can look at a quality wrapper around factors like high return on equity, strong balance sheets, strong free cash flow yield, positive earnings revisions. And I think that's the way to approach investing as an active investor versus trying to make a sector call or two. I, I look at well, the factor. Well, give me a factor then that matters. I mean, quality uh, matters, but is the factor simply ability to hold margins? Well, like I said, it's 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 the traditional quality factors like cash flow yield, in terms of strong balance okay. sheet, um, high cash on the balance sheet, low debt on the balance sheet. You get kind of a hybrid growth value factor in something like positive earnings revisions because if they're moving up, that means the forward PE is is moving down. So the um, lower lower volatility. I think those would be the types of factors that that have been more consistent as winners than what you're seeing at the sector level. And I think at least in the near term, that's likely to continue. Lizanne, before we let you uh, get on with your morning, I'd love your response to what's going on with Taiwan, the tension between China and the U.S. The knee-jerk response in markets has been risk off, but in particular, very much a leaning into longer-term treasuries. How much do you believe in that? How much would you look at that and see the 10-year going to 2 percent the way that Bank of America does in the next 6 to, 10, uh, six to 12 months? Yeah, so you all know my colleague and friend Kathy Jones, so I, I won't, you know, step into her world and, and make any kind of forecast of where the tenure is going, but we have been emphasizing moving out the duration spectrum, certainly when we were uh, a percent or so higher in the, the tenure yield. And I think that is partly in play here with regard to Taiwan, but I also think you had a guest on uh, pre-surveillance talking about the potential economic retaliation um, against maybe tech companies uh, in California. Um, that's not something we'll know imminently, but I, I think that's another thing to keep an eye on is not just does China do something militarily, but do they try to do something economically? I love Kathy Jones. And you too, Lizanne. It's great to catch up. Lizanne Did Saunders there. Did she say she watches pre-surveillance? Pre-surveillance, Tom. I thought she only started her morning with us. Well, she must wake up very, very early in the morning to watch all things pre-surveillance. I guess so. That's a good thing. Yeah, okay. TK Caterpillar recovering in the pre-market. Here are some of the numbers for you. <clears throat> Revenues for the second quarter of 22, 14.247 billion US. That's up 11% from the previous period last year, second quarter 21, which was $12.889 billion. Here's the line that stands out because we've seen this so many times in earnings reports so far this quarter. The increase was due to favorable price realization and higher sales volume, partially offset by unfavorable currency impacts, primarily related, Tom, to the euro, the Australian dollar, and the Japanese yen. Yeah. You're going to see that. I'd say 4% is sort of the going number. Caterpillar with a drawdown of 20%, John, back to the middle of last year. Yet 4% seems to be the going rate. I believe I noticed Apple Computer, my brain says six cents on the dollar. So FX has a real, you know, it, it's a real issue here. But what I would suggest is CAT is like FedEx, one of those global and domestic monitors of our continued ability to make profit. And the answers are making profit. And delivering growth as well, Lisa, at a tough time yeah. for the global economy. And how much is that growth going to continue to be centered in the United States? John, you asked a while ago, how much is this potential FX headwind an issue with the strength of the dollar or the weakness of the economies in other places relative to the U.S.? You're not going to get the same activity, perhaps, coming out of Europe in terms of the magnitude as you would in the U.S. Do you remember all that talk about a global reopening, a synchronized global growth story? 
story and now yeah. it starts to feel like a synchronized global downturn very quickly. Yeah. Futures down eight tenths on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about one full percentage point from New York City. Much more still to come on Speaker Pelosi's potential visit to Taiwan. We'll get Julie Norman's views, the co-director of the UCL Center of U.S. Politics, very shortly. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Threats by China don't appear to be deterring House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Later today, she's expected to become the highest ranking U.S. politician in 25 years to visit Taiwan. China has vowed an unspecified military response. Beijing regards Taiwan as part of its territory. The U.S. calls him a longtime terrorist leader who helped plan the 9-11 attack. Now President Biden says the leader of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, has been killed in Afghanistan by a U.S. drone strike. In a statement at the White House, the president said, quote, justice has been delivered. Senate Republicans plan to use an obscure rule as a weapon against the Democrats' surprise tax, health and climate deal. Their goal is to whittle down the $433 billion bill. They will invoke the so-called Byrd rule, which limits the ability to pass legislation with a simple majority. AP Muller Maersk has raised its profit forecast for the second time this year. Congression has on trade routes have boosted global freight rates, creating what Maersk calls an exceptional market for transport companies. Maersk controls about one-sixth of the world's container trade. And a think tank backed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation wants $50 billion in backing for an Africa debt plan. The proposal would help African nations with distress debt, re-enter capital markets and protect against future defaults. The think tank called the Finance for Development Lab was launched last month. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Since the United States delivered justice to bin Laden 11 years ago, Zawahiri has been a leader of al-Qaeda. Now, justice has been delivered, and this terrorist leader is no more. If you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. An address to the nation by the President of the United States yesterday evening from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Kravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. The focus on Taiwan and the potential visit from Speaker Pelosi in the next couple of hours. The focus for this market, too, we're lower on the S&P and on the Nasdaq 100 as well. The S&P weaker, lower, negative by three quarters of one percent on the Nasdaq 100, down by about one full percentage point. Bit of deal flow <coughs> to pick up on, Tom. The Wall Street Journal reported this could happen as soon as this morning, and it is happening this morning TD Bank to buy Cowan for $39 yeah. per share in cash Tom in equity exposure with a great securities research shop we've used that often Helene Becker and of course the legendary Kaivon room in aerospace and also uh, their retail very very strong John they go on to say it's about expanding Tom and the US investment banking yeah. capabilities mm -hmm. with this particular acquisition <clears throat> There it is. Right now, we get lucky. Julie Norman was scheduled to be with us on any number of topics. She's at the University College London Center on U.S. Politics. And in this world, she is absolutely definitive on al-Qaeda. So I'll ask her a few questions on the news of al-Qaeda, and then we'll move on to the issue of the moment, Taiwan. Professor Norman, thank you so much for joining us. What happens now to al-Qaeda after the death of 10 years ago plus of bin Laden, and now this latest drone murder. Well, Tom, the uh, strike on Zawahiri certainly closes a chapter, if you will, on 9-11 and the two main masterminds behind that. In terms of al-Qaeda itself, though, Zawahiri has really been more of a figurehead over these last 10 years. Al-Qaeda has been strongest mostly in its affiliate groups that operate much more at the local level, and they've lost a lot of ground to Islamic State, to Nusra Front, to other groups that have kind of filled that gap. So we will see probably another high-ranking al-Qaeda official step into that leadership role. But as an, as an organization, it's significantly decreased in terms of its impact uh, in the region, especially at that central point. One more question on this, because the news flow is extraordinary, is 
Is Al-Qaeda something of a certain country, whether it's Pakistan or Afghanistan, et cetera, et cetera, or is it a global organization we should fear? Well, I would say Al-Qaeda has, has, has usually fashioned itself as more of a network-based, more of an international kind of group. But I wouldn't say it's one that we should uh, harbor fear around. Obviously, there's always a threat. Obviously, you want to be careful. But again, that international kind of terrorism that really gripped our attention for so long has really seeded into much more locally-based kinds of actions that tend to be operating more within countries, especially in the Middle East and in Northern Africa, rather than targeting, say, the United States. So certainly a, uh, a severe threat for many in those areas, but not as much of an international threat for those uh, in North America, so to speak. Julie, the threat that's stemming from the escalating conflict between China and the U.S. is so different because it's not just a military one. It's very much an economic one. What are you watching in terms of the Chinese response to Nancy Pelosi's expected visit to Taiwan? How do you gauge what a true escalation is and how uh, they intend to see this conflict play out? Sure. So it's a good question because it's it's not clear how China will respond to this. There's been a lot of rhetoric saying that they will, but the means are still uh, somewhat to, to be seen. There's a lot of different options very short of a full-out head-to-head uh, -head conflict at this point. More likely to be a show of force, probably militarily, but as you said, also economically and politically. Most immediately, we'll likely see an increase in uh, military activities and exercises around Taiwan. Today, Chinese planes are up against the median line, which is kind of the, um, where, the, where the airspace uh, splits, probably likely to see more like missile launches close to Taiwan. Uh, so those are some things we'll probably see in terms of military response. There could also be uh, kind of legal claims to either blockading the Strait of Taiwan, saying that it's not an international waterway, perhaps laying claims to some of the offshore islands. And what I expect is just more ongoing in the weeks and months to come, just increasing pressure on Taiwan through cyber attacks, through political and economic pressure. And we'll see some of that in the terms of the U.S. as well, probably some fallout and diplomatic relations, which have actually remained relatively strong up until this point. Every Wall Street note that I've read this morning has tried to play out what the economic ramifications will be, not tomorrow, not in a week, not in a month, but in six months, in 12 months. How much does this escalate the decoupling of the U.S. and its reliance on China as the factory to the world? Well, it's going to have an impact. Whatever plays out in these next couple of days, what is clear now is that Taiwan and this increase in tension between China and the U.S. around it is going to be a major issue, as you said, probably for months to come. And that will affect markets as well as, of course, just the reality on the ground there. So in terms of the impact, right, it's, uh, it's yet to be seen. But the, this is, well, this, I see this as a sort of watershed and really shifting that this will become a major issue that we'll be paying attention to for quite a long time, no matter what happens this week. Julie, thank you for your input on an important conversation. Important event taking place potentially later this morning. Julie Norman there of the UCL Center on US politics. Speaker Pelosi expected to land in Taiwan, at least in about two hours and 30 minutes. Yeah, and stay there for the night. And this is uh, something where he is, she is flying in on a U.S. military plane. This is perhaps not endorsed by the administration, but certainly with the support of the nation. I'm looking to the economic play out here because, yes, there is this question of whether there are a few missiles lobbed. Nobody really thinks this is going to escalate into a real military, military conflict. But the reliance of the U.S. economy on China and China's precarious situation economically raise another special here of the cost and how this uh, potentially could evolve. You raise the economics. How many times have we discussed, Tom, the potential of removing tariffs on Chinese mm. goods? We were waiting for a decision from this president and now this. I, I totally agree with Lisa that the surprise here could be very surgical Chinese reactions to the manufacturing process and linkages across the Pacific. I think that's a sleeper here. Nobody's talking about it. I just find it highly, highly speculative <clears throat> at the moment. Oh, hugely. Tom, oh, yeah, Just absolutely. massively speculative as to what uh, may I, or may I think not everything happen. we're dealing here on 110 miles uh, between China and Taiwan is, is ma massively speculative. I will say, and this is, again, from the Council on Foreign Relations, it's usual that government officials will go to Taiwan on military aircraft. That's been widely documented over, I'll say, 30, 40 years. Might be easier to call the Fed, Tom, and work out what they're <clears> going to <throat> do next month. 
Yeah, we, and after that, we it's need probably forward, easier. We need forward guidance on Taiwan you as well. You want forward guidance. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? A dot plot. A dot plot too. My yes, forward Framo, guidance, to be honest, it's Liz Economy. I just put her out uh, her book on President Xi and the mystery. I just put that out on Twitter. ATK, she's it's great. Just, it's a great little book to read. She's been brilliant. Futures yeah. right now down eight-tenths of 1%. You know the story. Headline risk on the horizon, potentially. We're down a bit on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're negative one full percentage point. Yields come down for a fifth straight session, down two basis points to 254.99. The euro showing a bit of weakness, down a third of 1% at 102.25. And crude pulling back as well, down seven-tenths of 1% to 93.23. So the less constructive view, it comes this morning from Goldman. The more constructive view in the last 24 hours, guess where that comes from? Come from Marco Kalanovic over at JP Morgan. No. We'll see what Mandy Zua Credit Suisse thinks about this equity market coming up very shortly on this program with Tom Keat, <laughs> Lisa Abramitz, and Jonathan Ferro for our audience worldwide, heard on radio, seen on TV from a beautiful New York City. This is Bloomberg. The reality is the economy is weakening. It's probably going to weaken further. We're still in this race between a peak in inflation and what will probably be a mild recession. The Federal Reserve is unlikely to be kind to the equity market. If we see weakness in the labor market, how will the Fed's communication evolve? The market is basically pricing in a Fed put. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Jolts Tuesday. How's that? Does that work? Oh, it's got a sorry, ring to it. It does. It, it does. it jolted me out of my sleep from No News Monday. From New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. We're down three quarters of 1% on the S&P TK. Will she, won't she? She will reportedly go to Taiwan. We're <clears> talking <throat> about Speaker Pelosi this yeah. morning. And that is weighing down risk sentiment this morning. We do international relations and really front and center today, John. And I would say the ante's upped here in the last 12 hours. For our, our listeners of Global Wall Street, we're honing in on 10 a.m. this morning, Wall Street uh, time. And I, I do agree, John, this is really front and center for the global economy and our polity as well. Uh, Tom, you know the big unknown, how will China respond to this. When she was set to go back in spring, the rhetoric was a little bit different to the rhetoric we're experiencing right now. I'm trying to read in on it, and I think the answer is we don't have a clue. John, I think it's all original thinking here in every way, in every form, and it'll be interesting uh, to see lots of look back, some look present, and look forward is completely great. Completely Lisa, great. I think it's important to recognize it's not just about geopolitics this morning. I called it Jolts Tuesday. We get job openings data, the so-called Jolts data, a little bit later on top of all the Fed speak coming through this morning and this week. So much of the market move that we've seen over the past few weeks has been on this belief that there has been a rollover in inflation, that the labor market has peaked out, will start deteriorating, and give the Fed a reason to pull back. Do we see that from Jolt's job openings that exceeded 11 million? How much do they come down? How quickly? How much does that actually give the Fed confidence ahead of Jobs Friday that there is a, a reason to pause? And this at a time wrapping in the Taiwan uh, issue and China and the U.S., how much structural inflation is getting embedded into the global economy because of some of these geopolitical conflicts. And how much weaker the data has been yeah. out of China as well. And in the United States, the ISM manufacturing came in. Prices paid, Lisa, really came down. Now, when we look at job openings coming in, you'd argue that's the objective of this Fed. Is that ISM yesterday, was that the objective of this Fed, to see that kind of action? in those sub-indices, those sub-readings. Is the Fed tracking oil prices? I mean, is that essentially what this comes down to? Because when you looked at the underlying gauges of the ISM data, it showed a lot of this had to do with oil prices coming off the highs. Mm. So at what point is Fed policy just trying to target oil prices? And at what point can they establish which of the stickier, uh, more structural aspects of inflation that they need to uh, really address? Will you tell me if they're following headline or core? Because that seems to shift from meeting to meeting, and I'll tell you if they're following. You Mitch. Energy That's prices. Point. You Mitch, of course. <laughs> you Mitch Fridays, my favorite. <laughs> Futures down six tenths of one percent on the S P on the Nasdaq we're down six tenths of one percent as well. We recover just a little bit in the last five or ten minutes. Yields in a single basis point on a ten year lease. So what a turnaround from a month or so ago from three fifty, close to that level, all the way back down to two fifty six on a ten year and in America. Yeah, and Bank of America actually sees this going to two percent as soon as six to twelve months out because of some of this disinflationary pressure and because of the belief that the 
Fed will continue to raise rates and it will curtail longer term growth. To get a sense on that, it is Jolt's Tuesday. Uh, at 10 a.m. we get this data, the jobs openings, and how much does this give people a sense that there is a loss in momentum in the labor market, a softening, perhaps just a little bit lack of uh, pricing power for employees at a time when the employee cost index came in about where it was expected and is rising at a relatively uh, rapid pace historically. Today, we've been talking about it all morning. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi expects to be the first House Speaker to visit Taiwan in 25 years. How much does this really ratchet up tensions in a way that just doesn't deal with uh, the military approach of China and the U.S., but really the economic one? Expect a lot of reports trying to understand what a uh, reshaping of supply chains looks like. We've been seeing this all year. Companies that have been reshoring, have been rewarded. How much does that continue to be a trend? And today there's loads of Fed speak trying to perhaps push back against the dovish pivot that so many people are baking into the market. We get here from Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. And Tom mentioned this chart. This is real yields on the 10-year. John, at one point, they were pretty positive. They are now back down nearly to zero, an easing in financial conditions at a time when the Fed is hoping that a tighter financial uh, backdrop will lead to a decline in inflation. That'll get inflation down, Bramo. That'll do it. Well, let's see. I don't think a lot of people think that. We'll get some data next week. Premature is the word I've heard again and again and again. And you hear it from Credit Suisse too. Markets pricing Fed hiking cycle to be done by December, start cutting next year. We think that's premature. That was Mandy Zhu, the Chief Equity Derivative Strategist at Credit Suisse Securities. Mandy joins us right now here in New York. Mandy, let's start there. How do you play a peak in real yields? Sure, I get this question a lot. Um, you know, and, and the two, the most traditional way people look at it is either do you go long tech or do you go long gold? Because those two have historically had the most inverse relationship with real yields. And in my view, I think going long gold is a much better play um, for a peak in real yield rather than tech. And the, uh, and the key here is, you know, real yield could be going down either because of a dovish Fed or because of rising recession risk, right? And, and for tech, if it's rising recession risk, that doesn't bode well for tech as a cyclical sector. So for us... <clears throat> Uh, looking at upside in gold, and you have seen in the derivatives market more um, demand for upside uh, in GLD options, for example, to play that uh, peak in real yields. Liz Ann Saunders, who was with us 20 minutes ago, just put out on Twitter the Dallas trimmed inflation statistics, something Chairman Powell watches carefully. The first derivative of this over one month is stunning, 3.0, 3.1, and then an explosion in the Dallas trim from 5.2 out to a ginormous 6.9. How do you fold inflation into a conventional derivative strategy in equities? Sure. So I think the couple of ways you can look at it, so you can play it uh, through uh, you know, um, bond ETFs, right? So looking at, for example, we've been recommending people look at upside plays in TLT, which is longer dated bonds. And the view here is that the Fed actually will remain aggressive in trying to curb inflation and as a result, increase recession risk. And that means actually the back end of the yield curve goes down because that's much more a function of inflation and growth. You can look at it through hybrid options or equity options that are contingent on rates. So there are you know, different ways that you can play it. But I would say, you know, in my view, um, the market has it wrong that the Fed is going to pivot. I don't think inflation is going to come in that quickly. Um, you know, Powell has said that he needs clear and convincing evidence that inflation is falling back down to the 2% target. I don't think that we're going to get that anytime soon. Mandy, how much conviction, just to sort of zoom out here, how much conviction has this rally had behind it from a derivatives perspective? How much have people closed out their bearish bets on uh, the U.S. economy, on the U.S. stock market in particular, as the market rallied the most since November 2020? Well, first of all, what bearish bets, right? So I would say one of the, uh, the defining characteristics of this sell-off uh, in the first half of the year is that we've seen very, very little hedging in the derivatives market, and that contributes to you know the relatively lower levels of VIX, VVIX, all the measures that we track in, in options. And part of that is because we've seen already very significant deleveraging, de-risking in terms of underlying positions, so people selling out of stocks going into cash. Now, in, over the past week, we have seen some pickup of upside call buying, but certainly not sign significant enough. So I don't think this is a high conviction rally. If anything, I think this is much more a bear market rally. And Mandy, when you face the kind of headline risk that we face today, 
this event that could take place a little bit later this morning. Speaker Pelosi landing in Taiwan and the complete unknown as to how the Chinese will respond to it. What do you say to clients when they call you about how they should manage this situation? Sure. So on the topic of China, clearly a lot of headline risk in the near term, but actually the much bigger risk and what I've been emphasizing over the past few months um, in terms of the outlook for China, outlook for global economy, is China's zero COVID policy. And that's going to have a much bigger economic impact. It's going to have a much bigger market impact than whatever happens, you know, in the next 24 hours uh, on the geopolitical front. Uh, and the key here is that, you know, if you talk to investors, most people still expect China to pivot from the zero COVID COVID policy because of the economic cost. And my view there is, if you listen to Xi, if you listen to the top Chinese leadership, they're very ideologically committed to zero COVID. I do not think in a politically sensitive year, such as this year for China, they're going to abandon uh, zero COVID anytime soon. Um, and I think that's just going to mean a bigger demand shock for global growth, a bigger demand shock for commodities. And I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons why we've been pretty bearish on, on commodities uh, as of late. Mandy Zhu, thank you, as always, from Credit Suisse here in New York. I think that final point is such a good point. Lisa, you can try and navigate the headline risk, but it's almost impossible. This kind of event and the response to it has the potential to be highly significant. At the same time, it has the potential just to pass you by, something we don't talk about in the next several weeks and months. What we do know is exactly what Mandy just said. We're already seeing weakness in the Chinese economy. It's easy to identify. We already know that COVID zero is something they're committed to for now and could well be through the rest of this year. That's going to make things very problematic for that economy. And also problematic for how you deal with it if you're an investor because you see these oil companies coming out reporting record earnings, delivering higher dividends, enticing investors back at a time where if you see that deterioration in demand coming from China, that could already have been the peak in what we've seen in terms of commodity demand. So how do you play this at a time when that has been the hedge against inflation and suddenly it's a little bit more in question? This sounds very bearish. So to balance it out, we go to one man. Marco Kalanovic of JP Morgan, and he says this, Tom, whether it's earnings or the Fed, we see a reset of investor expectations. Oh. Risk markets are rallying despite some disappointing data releases, he goes on to say, indicating bad news was already anticipated slash priced in. Yeah, I thought Stuart Kaiser was absolutely brilliant yesterday with UBS. John, there's others. John Stolfus at Opco as well. They're looking at earnings. They're looking at persistency of earnings. The Uber free cash flow statistic, which Joe Weisenthal just underscored, is an act of God. What Uber has done to generate cash there and on and on. I noticed separately, John, the big survive. UAL killing it. Delta, I believe, killing it. JetBlue was not good. We'll get to the less constructive view with Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley yes, in the we're next fair and hour. Looking forward to that at 8 Eastern time, so around about 50 minutes on TV and radio. That conversation coming up just around the corner. Futures down 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. We'll catch up with the team down in D.C. next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to land in Taiwan in a few hours. Defying Chinese threats of military action, the trip will make Pelosi the highest ranking American politician to visit there in 25 years. China regards Taiwan as part of its territory. It has vowed an unspecified military response to a Pelosi visit. President Biden says a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan has killed one of the planners of the 9-11 attacks. Ayman al-Zawahiri was the leader of al-Qaeda, according to a senior administration official. The drone attack had been planned for weeks. Zawahiri was in a house in Kabul and was said to have been killed when he stood out on a balcony. Three U.S. states have now declared a state of emergency in response to the monkeypox outbreak. California joined New York and Illinois in announcing the emergency. Their goal is to bolster vaccination efforts and stem the rise in infections. The three states account for almost half the roughly 6,000 monkeypox infections in the U.S. And in the UK, Liz Truss vows to cut waste, bureaucracy and inefficiency in the civil service if she becomes Prime Minister. Truss is the front runner in the race with Rishi Sunak to succeed Boris Johnson. She says she can save taxpayers billions of pounds a year by altering pay scales and slashing holiday allowances. 
BP has increased its dividend and accelerated share buybacks to the fastest pace yet. The London-based energy company posted its highest net income since 2008. Earnings were driven by more than high crude and natural gas prices. BP's refineries earned strong margins and its oil traders delivered what was called an exceptional performance. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Earning season is here. Everything yes. I've read has yes. just got the R word. Resilience, not recession. Earnings are expected to be so weak that I think that presents a very intriguing opportunity. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. We get a deluge of earnings globally this week from Alphabet and Microsoft. With exclusive expert analysis. These earnings have proved to be really inconsistent, not actually showing a real picture that goes one way or another. Bloomberg Television and Radio, the fastest numbers and analysis you trust. I think what has happened with Speaker Pelosi's trip is she has raised very high expectations in Taiwan, very high anxieties in China. I believe uh, that our, how we deal with uh, Taiwan is a very big, bright red line as far as the Chinese are concerned. I think they will find a way to respond uh, in their own fashion that will inflict some harm upon us. That's the main event this morning. That was William Cumming, the former Secretary of Defense. The main event being Speaker Pelosi landing in Taiwan potentially in about two hours' time. From New York City, make that three hours' time. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down about six-tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq. 100 we're down by seven tenths of one percent yields come in a couple of basis points you can tell it's pretty defensive out there yields down to 255 yeah, 52. Nice I keep hammering this one home though this turnaround in yields <clears throat> has just been a monster move on the 10 year from the middle of June from about 350 all the way back down well, Tom, to 256. John you see it in two ten spread inverting out to negative 31 basis points that's uh, two-thirds of the way to the pre and misra mark even closer in her 40 basis point call real yields maybe not as gyrational as they were an hour ago but john the the, the velocity of the move is shocking somebody's losing money out there as lisa pointed out this morning tom that's the deepest <clears throat> inversion going now, back more than 20 years i continue this on apple but right now we've got to migrate forward to joe matthew here on the issue at hand which is speaker pelosi's uh, moment on the way to taiwan mr matthew of course look for at 5 p.m tonight sound on on bloomberg at radio. Joe Matthew, what I find so interesting here is what I haven't heard out of Washington, which is how alone is Speaker Pelosi on this trip? I don't see people lining up on marble steps saying blah, 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 for or against. How alone is she? Well, look, I think that she's actually got the support of both parties all of a sudden, thanks to the, the, the rhetoric coming from China. This is a Codell this is common during the August recess that members go to yes. various countries. This is a particularly uh, sensitive one, however. But look, we've heard from both Republicans and Democrats who say you can't turn back now. She has every right to visit that country. And even the White House made clear last evening, as John Kirby said, we can't tell <clears> her not to go. And it, it is no change in policy. And there is, in fact, precedent for this uh, trip. So Beijing, what's the problem? The gentleman from Maine was with us yesterday, Secretary Cohen, of course, uh, Secretary of Defense, ages ago. And, Joe, this is a Taiwan that's changed. When Cohen was uh, leading the charge, there was almost no exports from Taiwan to China. And now mainland China is 30 percent of their export business. I mean, they're, they're amazingly entwined as two economies, aren't they? That is absolutely right, and that is another avenue for China to respond. We've been talking about so many different possible military responses that could happen. Maybe they drop some missiles into the sea. Maybe there's an incursion of Taiwanese airspace. But how about a financial uh, response, a diplomatic and economic response? These are all likely being considered right now by China, and I'm not sure that we'll see one immediately. This could take days before Nancy Pelosi comes home, holds a news conference here, and then you see the reaction from China. They're taking this very seriously, and I also wonder for that reason how pronounced this visit will be. I mean, we're going to, obviously, Pelosi will be welcomed warmly by Taiwan. They are very much looking forward to this. 
Uh, but are we going to have the red carpet arrival? Is there going to be a, uh, an announcement by Pelosi? Or will we have to wait hours after the fact to see some images? It'll be interesting to see how the administration and the speaker's office decide to disseminate all of that. Joe, how much discussion is there about how to gird for potential economic ramifications from an escalating conflict between the U.S. and China? And I think in particular of uh, the Taiwan uh, semiconductor manufacturing uh, capabilities, yeah. the fact that this is one of the main sources of semiconductors for the world at a time when that was one of the key components that was disrupting supply chains a couple of years ago. How is the U.S. prepared for a possible disruption or uh, just in general, uh, ramping up production in other places. Well, this was the exact argument that Gina Raimondo was making to get the CHIP Act passed, to say that, look, what if, uh, what if we couldn't get chips out of Taiwan anymore? What if there was a Chinese blockade? What if something happened that would impact our national security, never mind consumer goods around the country? So that's why they really got that across the finish line. It was the national security aspect. It was competing with China. As far as the rest of it goes, this is part of a much bigger conversation that the administration is having right now that also involves Chinese tariffs and also involves the potential for a face-to-face -face meeting between Presidents Biden and Xi. They, of course, met by phone a couple of days ago, and that, that prompted a whole bunch of the rhetoric that we've been hearing uh, about Nancy Pelosi. But a sit-down meeting between the two of them could bring much more opportunity to advance uh, the political and economic agenda for the U.S. Joe Matthew down in D.C. Joe, thank you. TK, the more we hear about that call last week, the more contentious it sounds between the two well, leaders. Well, could that call have happened this week? And, and th that, I think, is a really important question, John, the deterioration here. I mean, they're supposed to meet. What are they going to meet and talk about? Hey, TK, I mean, when's that going to happen? Wow. And what are they going to talk about exactly? And, Lisa, the idea that they remove tariffs anytime soon, that seems to have slipped way off the radar yeah. in the last couple of days. Seems like that's pretty much off the table at this point, considering that now there's going to be a question of penalties. How much did that conversation really foreshadow uh, this whole visit by Pelosi to <clears throat> Taiwan, considering that neither of them said, neither, Ta neither uh, Xi Jinping or Joe Biden's camp said that it was a constructive call, that both of them said that they were going to plan in-person uh, in meetings. How much was that in anticipation of a ratcheting up in this conflict to try to come to some understanding because neither nation can handle the economic fallout of this right now, particularly China. So how does the U.S. use that leverage? And the tension's been simmering for quite a while, Tom. You know that. It seemed to have been reinforced by what happened in Ukraine earlier this year, Tom, and how China seemingly <clears throat> took the yeah, side I, of Russia against the wishes of the U.S. administration. Yeah, th there's no question about that. The linkage is there as well. But what I would go back to, John, is a change in rhetoric, and you're going to reach back four, five, and six years. And as you mentioned earlier, John, this is also about the sea change in China. This is forget about the China of Newt Gingrich or Henry Kissinger. This isn't the China of early Obama. That's really well framed, and they're Did getting even okay more there? hawkish on foreign policy on the international stage. Better than okay. We understand, and this is all we understand at this point, according to Taiwan's Liberty Times that we will get Speaker Pelosi landing in the country at 10.20 p.m. local time. So I make that about three hours from now, Lisa. And from there, who knows? Yeah, well, and how quickly do we get a response, too? You get the immediate response, uh, the, the pomp and the circumstance, the show, perhaps a missile uh, flying into a sea somewhere. But at what point do we start to see the real fissures begin? How far does it go? Holding back markets a little bit today. We're down about six tenths on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're down seven tenths of one percent. It's defensive out there, but a risk aversion. You see it weighing on the equity market. It's pulling down yields as well. Not as much as it was earlier this morning, but down about a basis point on a 10-year to 255.88. Better dollar strength against the euro. Euro dollar negative two tenths at 102. 43 and crude just about turning around in the last hour. Now positive on the session from New York. This is Bloomberg. Two ways of looking at this market right now. Risk markets are rallying despite some disappointing data. That indicates that a lot of this was already anticipated, priced in. Those are the words 
of JP Morgan's Marko Kalanovic. The other way is from Goldman. They say we're getting too complacent too soon. You'll get Mike Wilson's view over at Morgan Stanley in about 30 minutes from now. Just want to give you a picture of events this morning. We're waiting for Speaker Pelosi potentially to land in Taiwan in a little under three hours from now. Going into that, we don't know how China responds to it. So futures naturally decline, down six tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down seven tenths of one percent as well. The spillover pretty clear into the bond market, though things get a little bit better as this session grows older. Yields are still coming in a couple of basis points on a 10 year to 255 on a 30 year down three basis points to about 288. Your 10 year, though, as we keep saying, has gone from close to 350 in the middle of June all the way down to 255. That's done a lot of work on this yield curve. Twos versus tens has oh. inverted the difference between the two, Tom. Negative 30 basis points. And I'll also point out the three month versus the 10 year. About yeah, that's that far where I away would go. from inversion as well. John, the spread market is speaking volumes this morning, and it's really repricing in some form of slowdown. I mean, you know, everybody in the equity market's got an opinion here, an opinion there. I'm not sure which one to believe. The market is telling me slowdown. Things are getting defensive. And yeah. just to capture some of that defensiveness, it's not just <clears throat> yields lower for five days. It's the Japanese yen stronger for five straight days as well. Dollar yen from the middle of July, close to 140. Back now to 130, 130.97, Tom. That's some real yen strength. How to play it, we mentioned this in the last hour. Jordan Rochester of Nomura, he likes the short against the euro. He wants to play that against the Japanese yen. He's looking for euro yen to come down, Tom, from 134, where we are right now, potentially yeah. breaking into the 120s. Just looked at the standard deviation study, and you're right, John, that's a really, really strong Japanese yen, way out, way out. Uh, past two standard deviations uh, as well. As you said, Tom, it's all about yields. We've got some risk aversion accompanied Spreads. with lower yields, yep. and that's bumping <clears throat> into a stronger Japanese yen. The yen story starting to work in a way that it didn't work at all at the start of the year. That's the cross asset price section. Let's get you some single names. We can do that this morning with Bramo. Hey, Lisa. Hey, John. And I got to say, Tom has been saying that if you look at the companies, it doesn't confirm the gloom. And he's right, at least when it comes to a lot of the companies that have reported earnings so far. We've had about three quarters of them. Them. Two names that I want to pick out uh, that are doing really well, Pinterest and Uber. Those shares are both down more than 40% so far ahead of today's trading session. You can see both shares popping dramatically. Pinterest reported earnings yesterday after the bell. Those shares up nearly 20%. Yes, Elliott Management taking a majority stake, but also the resilience of their user base, uh, which is major majorly uh, uh, female and is down about 5% on the year, but still a lot more robust than people had expected. Uber, better than expected earnings at a time when they're facing off with a uh, ride sharing inflation amid all of the uh, inflationary inputs that we're seeing. Those shares up about 11 percent ahead of the open. Not doing so hot. JetBlue. Those shares down 3.3 percent, uh, 3.4 percent on the heels of demand being very strong, capacity not meeting that, not seeing capacity coming up as much as perhaps uh, people want. Interesting that the share price uh, is coming down so much, even though people are still paying more and more than people had expected for those airline tickets. And then we've been covering this all week, but the oil companies, those earnings have just been dramatic. They have been record-breaking in many capacities. BP posting uh, the best <coughs> earnings going back to 2008. Those shares up 2.5%, increasing dividends across the board. Interesting that Devon Energy and Diamond Energy, both uh, which reported earnings yesterday after the bell, both had record profits. These are the two biggest shale and oil producers in the United States. They both talked about increasing dividends. Both those shares prices down. So, Tom, at what point do lower, lower oil prices and the potential backdrop of slowing demand start to eat into some of these oil companies even as they report record earnings? Well, and of course, the divide here, as we saw with Ed Morris' Citigroup, uh, Lisa, the other day, really quite extraordinary, modeling out $80 as a possibility on oil. Brent crude, the global price now with a $6 spread uh, off of West Texas Intermediate. Brent crude, $101. A barrel. Helene Becker knows about JetBlue. She put a reaffirmed outperform on JetBlue yesterday. She is at Cowan, and she's, as of this morning, going to have the good counsel of Mark McCormick, as TD says they will take out uh, Helene Becker's Cowan. That will be a good match, Mark McCormick and Helene Becker. And Mr. McCormick joins us now, global head of FX strategy at TD Securities. Let's start with square one, Mark. What's the dollar going to do in the next year? I think in the next year, we, we, we will talk about the peak dollar story. That's really not where we're at right now in the next couple of months. But if we look where we are and extrapolate past this year, 
Uh, it does look like we're, we have the conditions of peak dollar, which is Fed's cutting rates. The global economy can be recovering. We know the eurozone right. is is slipping into a recession, but all of those factors should likely turn by next year. So I think that is the big forecasting story: is the turning of the dollar into next year. Then on a risk-adjusted basis, including geopolitical risk-adjusted, which is the currency flat on its back where the greatest weak dollar opportunity is? It's still yen. We've talked about it a lot. Really, it's, yen. It's, it, yeah. It's the, yeah, in a valuation perspective, if you think about why the dollar could peak, if, if the Fed is cutting rates next year, and if you think about, we talked about the yield curve, 50% of the U.S. yield curve is inverted now. So if we, if we think about the slowing conditions of the U.S. and we think about how much yen has moved from fair value, uh, fair value for the yen is somewhere in, the, in 110, 115. So if we think about the reversal of the dollar, the DXY, the euro still has a lot of cyclical problems to deal with. But, you know, the big driver of what's pushed the yen weaker, it's been global rates moving higher and the oil in the terms of trade shock. And if, if you've already mentioned on the oil side, like we're expecting oil prices to be lower next year as well. So the combination of those factors, peak higher rates and essentially a peak in the terms of trade cycle, which has really been challenging for Asian currencies for the last six months, those reversals would help us see dollar yen move back closer towards fair value. Uh, rather than you know trading at the massive premium we see it now. Is that regardless of where risk sentiment is at any given time, Mark? Is this a risk-off trade that now works, or is it just more broadly a trade that's going to work through the end of the year because of the dynamics that you described? Well, it, the risk-off helps, and I think the risk-off helps because it's pushing yields lower. And I think that's it's an important combination. And, and what we're starting to see is the Fed had articulated a bit of a focus on growth, we know that they're not there yet, and it's too early to trade this as a durable theme. Um, I, still, I still think in the near term, we got to be buying the dollar against most major currencies, mm -hmm. even the euro and European currencies. But if we are talking about the next six months to a year, the conditions are changing where U.S. data is deteriorating. And again, in a backdrop, it doesn't have to be risk off. But we're not going to see this persistent deterioration in the terms of trade where oil prices are at 100 and 120 dollars a barrel if we are talking about oil below 100 next year uh that will be very positive for the japanese trade balance which would also be good for the european trade balance as well so mark let's say that the fed doesn't pivot let's say that the fed does continue to raise rates and that you start to see uh some concern about having to go further and and, uh, and perhaps faster than people are expecting and i think about zoltan pozar over at credit suisse talking about a five to six percent fed funds rate eventually in order to get inflation down does that eradicate the idea of peak dollar and you start to forecast a much stronger dollar to come absolutely uh we are not playing you know with our baseline as a five six percent uh terminal rate so right now you can even see we're we're a bit more hawkish than where the market's currently priced which is why we like the dollar now if we're talking about a five six percent terminal rate next year then absolutely we talk about risk off we talk about a global recession uh this reinforces where we've been the last couple of months which is a global demand shock plus the fed offering the dollar is like the world's uh key safe haven if you think about three factors that have like or assets that have done quite well in the last three months, it's energy prices, Chinese equities, and the dollar. Like that's really all there's been. So the dollar's offering the properties of relatively higher yields and a decent you know, relative beta to a glo uh, declining global economy. So if we are talking about a five, 6% uh, Fed terminal rate, then the, the peak dollar story will not persist. Mark, what's your highest conviction trade right now? I still think it's the, it's the yen crosses. I know we've moved a lot in the short term, but as you mentioned, I think some of the European crosses look vulnerable. If we're talking about just this week, I think sterling, we got the Bank of England, sterling yen downside, I think is quite attractive. Euro yen down, uh, downside is quite attractive as well. Well, give, it, um, wait, so whoa, 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 I, give us some numbers on this. My head's spinning, Mark. Give us some yen. <laughs> you know, John, take notes, please. I'm, I, I, don't, I lost my surveillance pencil. John, give me a yen number. Like short yen now is to what? So I'd say right now, if we if this week in general, we are expecting better than U.S. data. So I think we get a dollar yen reversal up to about, say, 133. There is a good fade point. So, again, if we could see another half percent move higher in euro yen, um, again, I think we're going through 130 as well. So I think that would be a good short term setup. And then a year from now, are you to 120, which is two, two standard deviations out or can yen strengthen out to a 115? We still have yen kind of coming in around 120-ish, uh, but again, in the backdrop that we we had discussed, where we do see the terminal rate probably like three and a half to four rather than five to six, uh, that environment would be quite bullish uh, for the yen, particularly if oil prices and the wow. terms of trade shock, which would, uh, yeah, that would start to reverse. John, so we this, are in the 120s. John, does this work for my 401k? Mark, how relieved are you that foreign exchange is no longer boring? <laughs> <laughs> 
it would be great if the the regime didn't change every week, but yeah, it's gotten a lot. It's gotten very interesting uh, in terms of how you know people care about FX. Wow. Again. Hey, Mark, good to catch up. Mark McCormick at TD. TK, do you remember that period of time? It went on for years. No one really cared what you <laughs> yeah. thought about foreign exchange. Yeah, Let's Michael. Just kind of move Ro on. The, we don't the, need this. The giant Michael Rosenberg worked with us, and I'd walk by his desk, and he'd be dozing off. Nobody's dozing off now. That's amazing to translate that, John. Week yen, 130 to 133 is, I think, what McCormick said. And then the one-year call is a ginormous move of strong yen. I think he said 120-ish. Well, look at the call from Jordan Rochester this morning over at Nomura, yeah. Tom. 134 on euro yen right now. Mm. He's targeting 125. Yeah, exactly. By the end of September. Yeah, let me look at that. That's the call. So that's yeah. your time frame, Lisa, and that's your number. How much is that basically the weakening in the dollar or basically uh, this move away from a hawkish Fed, a hawkish ECB, no matter what, is what would allow Japan to move away from some of their pegs, basically giving them breathing room, right? That's been always the theory that could potentially trigger this significant rally that people are calling for in the yen. At risk of sounding like Tom, shout out to Nomura for presenting their research in this way, Lisa. They put their level of conviction yeah. next to the trade. I yeah, love they that. They rate it out of five. Yeah. So they've got a four out of five conviction on a short euro got, yen trade, Tom. I've got a high conviction. I need a freshener on the time. Um, I have no doubt that you've got high conviction of that every single morning, every hour, <sighs> repeatedly. Futures down six tenths. The interns are making it nice. It's, it's on the not Nasdaq, as dilute as it was. We're down made. three quarters of one percent. It's a serious morning. It is. Believe it or not. Speaker Pelosi seemingly heading to Taiwan. The latest out of Asia coming up. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Threats by China don't appear to be deterring House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Later today, she's expected to become the highest ranking U.S. politician in 25 years to visit Taiwan. China has vowed an unspecified military response. Beijing regards Taiwan as part of its own territory. The U.S. calls him a longtime terrorist leader who helped plan the 9-11 attacks. Now President Biden says the leader of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, has been killed in Afghanistan by a U.S. drone strike. In a statement at the White House, the president said, quote, justice has been delivered. Senate Republicans plan to use an obscure rule as a weapon against the Democrats' surprise tax, health and climate deal. Their goal is to whittle down the $433 billion bill. This will invoke the so-called Bird Rule, which limits the ability to pass legislation with a simple majority. And shares of Uber jumped this morning. The ride-hailing company reported that second quarter revenue more than doubled, beating estimates. Meanwhile, Uber's gross bookings, which include passenger rides, food delivery and freight, rose 33% to an all-time high. And more earnings. Caterpillar posted second quarter sales that beat estimates. Still, the maker of construction and mining machinery saw a slowdown in China. Caterpillar said that unfavorable manufacturing costs largely reflected higher prices for material and freight. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think it's a mistake for the speaker to go to Taipei. Um, the goal of uh, foreign policy with respect to China is to reduce tensions, not to increase tensions. And her visit to Taiwan will clearly increase tension. That's the main event this morning. Speaker Pelosi heading to Taiwan. Max Belkus there, the former U.S. ambassador to China. From New York, this is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane <clears throat> and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures are down six tenths on the S&P, down three quarters of one percent on the Nasdaq 100. Yields lower by two basis points, 254.99 on a 10-year. Lots of economic data this week. Job openings in America, the jolts data coming up a little bit later. And Thompson Fed speak as well through this morning. Uh, are they going to speak forward guidance? What do you think? I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me how that's going to shift, how we treat that. They've got to talk to us yeah. about how they are dependent on the yeah. data, I, not just telling us they are data dependent. And they've got to reestablish their reaction yeah. function, so to speak, after a lot of people saw the words of Chairman Powell last week as yeah. very dovish. John, very quickly here, real yield was down to a 0 0.03, now 0 0.07, a little bounce there in the right direction for many. Two-tenth spread, negative 31 beeps speaks volumes. Oh, what a move we've seen, Tom. Yeah. And you mentioned the three-month, ten-year as well, about that far away from inversion, yeah. too. 
This is an important conversation. We are looking towards Speaker Pelosi's historic trip, looking back to Speaker Gingrich of 1997. John, we see that at about 10 a.m., right? Something 10.25, according to local okay, reports. Okay, 10.25, very good. So here is our conversation of the day, which we can do across the Bloomberg world. Samson Ellis is Bloomberg Taipei bureau chief, but far, far more than that, someone who has lived the Chinese experience. We're thrilled he could join us today from Taipei. Samson, I want to know what the people of Taiwan think, and I say this with great respect for the lectures I've had over the years from Taiwanese who make clear I'm an idiot conflating China and Taiwan. That would be Elaine Chao, the secretary, uh, a Republican secretary married to Mitch McConnell, and also the official Scarlet Foo of Bloomberg, who once took my head off as I conflated Taiwan and China. What do the people of Taiwan think this morning? Well, you're definitely treading on very dangerous territory, though, whenever you get into that debate over Taiwanese versus Chinese, for sure. I, I, I feel your pain there. Uh, but today, we're absolutely, we're finally getting to the sense of palpable expectation in Taipei. Uh, we're in the final countdown of, uh, you know, answering this question. M much of the globe has been asking for the, for the last week, week, will Pelosi come to Taiwan or won't she? In the next few hours, we will get that answer. And all indications right now are that she will be here. Uh, as for how people in Taiwan are receiving this, well, largely for much of the last week, it's been with a collective shrug, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, Taiwan is always, uh, always welcomes these kinds of uh, high profile visits. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is often largely excluded on, t on the international stage. So when a figure like Pelosi uh, is willing to come to Taiwan, right. usually that's a uh, cause for joy in Taiwan. But obviously, there are negative consequences right. to that. Our John Farrow has made very clear, and I think John's correct, that the sea change for us is President Xi, a different leadership in Beijing. Do the people of Taiwan, the government of Taiwan, do they see a sea change in Chinese leadership out of Beijing? There's no doubt that Xi Jinping has changed everything with regards to China's relations to its periphery and the rest of the world. Um, if you go back 10 years, the predominant sense in Taiwan, in Taiwan is you had a pro-Chinese government, a government that, a party that supported eventual unification with China. 10 years later, we're in a very, very different place in Taiwan, where there's a rapidly growing uh, sense of nationhood in Taiwan. Uh, and Taiwan is moving ever further and further away uh, from this dream, uh, Xi Jinping's dream of unification. Samson, what has the lesson been for Taiwan from what happened in Ukraine? Yeah, Taiwan has been watching events in Ukraine very, cl very closely, as has uh, China, obviously, um, to learn exactly how, and the, the comparisons are obvious, you know, how can a smaller uh, entity defend itself against its much, much larger, more powerful neighbor. Um, I think definitely the lessons that it has learned are that uh, first, you have to prepare, you have to get your population ready. The population has to be willing to fight. I think a lot of Taiwanese have been actually quite moved by what they've seen in Ukraine about how willing people are to stand up and potentially even laying down their lives to de defend their country. Uh, and so there are definitely moves here to start preparing uh, the population to be mentally ready to potentially uh, stand up and fight. Then obviously you've got all the log logistical stuff, like can you get enough uh, munitions here? Can you get enough materiel here uh, that would sustain a fight until potentially you get uh, bigger allies such as the United States, potentially Japan coming to help you. But there's certainly one thing that is also shown is that Taiwan would not be able to fight that fight on its own. Samson, uh, just quickly here, Tom began the segment asking you what the mood was like, and you said it's a shrug. People don't really care. Is there, however, some concern about the economic blowback from China penalizing Taiwan, if not from a military perspective, but an economic one? That is obviously the predominant concern. You know, while people do broadly welcome uh, these kinds of visits that put ta puts Taiwan in the international spotlight, uh, 
people are absolutely aware that it does come with some negatives, and we saw that uh, just yesterday when China banned uh, the imports of uh, foodstuffs from Taiwan. Uh, and so well, one of the difficult things for Taiwan is, you know, it didn't ask for the visit. It, it'll open its arms to Pelosi. It will welcome her. But Taiwan did not initiate this, and it did not ask for this visit. But Taiwan is going to suffer the repercussions of China's wrath because of this visit. So Taiwan really is in a difficult position because of this. Samson, I only have 30 seconds, but I think it's important to squeeze this in. What changed from your perspective, from China's perspective, in the last three, four months, when Speaker Pelosi was due to go last time around in spring and couldn't because she contracted COVID? I don't remember this kind of rhetoric. What changed, do you think? Well, I think this also goes back to Ukraine, you could say, in that China is watching what's going on there. And it really, really notices that it needs to message very, very strongly if it's going to deter uh, greater integration and greater contact between Taiwan and the United States, precisely because, to be perfectly honest, it probably isn't quite ready to launch the kind of full-scale invasion uh, that we may see five, six, seven years from now or a decade from now. Um, so it needs to message very, very aggressively to convince the rest of the world uh, to back off Taiwan right now. Samson, wonderful to catch up with you. Fantastic to hear your perspective on the ground in Taiwan. Samson Ellis there on the latest, Tom, a unique perspective on the ground. And I think that's important to get at this point. And I think the takeaway from that, and Lisa mentioned it a couple of times, Tom, just a collective shrug from a lot of people over there. We've got these people worldwide across the Bloomberg world, and it's valuable. John, I, you know, I know it's a serious day, but maybe a road trip to Taipei is I order. had a feeling I've, you might be saying I that, I have Tom. been in the airport. That's all I've been. I think uh, we need to do more than that. You've not been to the bar somewhere yeah. in Taipei. I'm sure you've got things to no, say. No, I've only been to the airport in Taipei, but did we you, need to do more. Did you have more. a drink there? Yes, I did. We I need to do more. <laughs> Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley. Had an umbrella in it. Coming up next <clears throat> on this equity market, this is Bloomberg. Speakers are looking at the market reaction, and the higher inflation is a game changer. I think a great deal of the inflation that we've already experienced doesn't have a life of its own. We think that core inflation will be stickier and more persistent. This is a U-shaped recovery. We're going to bounce around until we get the validation that inflation is coming down. The investor conversation is not if there's a recession, right? It's when and how much. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Kane. A most unusual Tuesday. Yes, the market's on the move, but it is a Tuesday of international relations. In two hours plus, the Speaker of the House scheduled to land in Taiwan. John R. Danny Lee reporting uh, here a few hours ago. People looking at flight radar of a trip from Singapore through the Philippines to Taiwan. A local reports indicating touchdown, Tom, something around 1020, 1025. We're all trying to work out how China's going to respond to this. We caught up with Samson Ellis on the ground in Taiwan here at Bloomberg just moments ago, Tom, and he talked about how China had banned 35 <clears throat> Taiwanese food exporters. We're going to see more of that that hits Taiwan or something direct, more direct, specific, Tom, at the United States. And maybe, John, even something like cancelled plans of a Biden G meeting. I mean, that awaits out, I believe, into August and maybe even September, you really wonder of the upset and the ramifications of this for global finance and Wall Street. Yeah, Tom, we were talking about removing tariffs moments ago, weren't we, in the last couple of weeks? That's yeah. taken a back seat. Let's be fair, that's taken a back seat. The other issue as well for me, Tom, we talked about it repeatedly over the last week. What's changed? Back in spring, Speaker Pelosi was due to go to Taiwan. Yes, we got mm. some pushback from the Chinese government. I don't remember this kind of rhetoric. TK, I really don't. And I think what experts are telling us at the moment is that some of this is linked back to what's been happening with Ukraine and how close China has come to Russia and maybe some increased nervousness about what may or may not happen over in Taiwan. And again, Tom, I think we've got to state the obvious, the economy, right. the domestic issues that this leader mm. is facing. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We have a compressed uh, beginning here with Michael Wilson of Morgan Stanley scheduled to be with us. John, a headline just out, the Taiwan president website under attack from 5.15 p.m., that from an official of the Taiwanese uh, government. Just one of the distractions here as we move towards Pelosi's visit. John, I want to dovetail fixed income into the cautious view of Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley, and we begin with spread compression this morning that's extraordinary. Equities lower, yields lower. 
Equities down about six tenths of one percent. <coughs> Yields come in, the curve inverted. Right. Well, Mike and the team at Morgan Stanley have been good at Tom, and I think it's important to frame it this way. Initially, a market trades on lower yields, and they get support from lower yields, and then you start to work out why yields are lower, and you trade on that instead. Yields are lower because <coughs> the perceptions of growth in this economy, Tom, right. have come in. The decelerating growth data we've seen is obvious, and at some point, that's going to factor into lower earnings. And I want to squeeze this in, Lisa, because we saw it, and it's in your space of IG. Yesterday, the IG of IG was Apple, and their 40-year piece was rumored 150 basis points over Treasury, and they got much more attractive terms on that, down to 118 uh, basis points. What does that say about quality in the fixed income space Mike Wilson doesn't care about? Some people would say that this would be a peak. At least this might be the perception of one by Apple if they're trying to get in and borrow money at this point. I'm not going to make a, a statement like that. But what I will say is you are starting to see the market revive in force. Companies yeah. borrowing after the rally that we saw in July. How much is it trying to get in while the getting's good? At least right. this window, uh, perhaps, of opportunity. John, let's do data. And then I want you to bring in Mike Wilson. 24.20 on the VIX, up a stick. Two, two points in the last couple of days. Equities down six. Tens, Tom on the S&P on the Nasdaq, we're lighter, softer, lower, negative three quarters of one percent. It's defensive out there. You see it in the bond market, yields lower by a couple of basis points, 255, 35 on a 10 year. You see it in the FX market with a stronger Japanese yen. We have got to talk about the rally we've seen. Joining us now is Mike Wilson. I'm pleased to say the chief U.S. equity strategist over at Morgan Stanley. Mike, over the weekend and Tom and I talked about it. You used that word dream, this equity market's dreaming. Why is that dream misplaced? Well, we don't know exactly uh, if it's dream. It is always dreaming. I mean, the equity market is uh, tends to be forward thinking, like most markets, but particularly equities. And I think what you know, our the phrase we used was really just trying to imply: look, we have this window of opportunity for equity investors where rates are coming down, and you can interpret that a couple of different ways. You can interpret it as if the Fed is close to being done, and they're going to be able to pause uh, or pivot before the next recession arrives, and that window is always positive for stocks. So uh, the equity market is trying to get in front of that pivot. I think it's premature, uh, to say the least. Um, I, I also believe that by the time they do pivot or pause, probably something bad has happened uh, on the growth side. And that's really our core view. So look, we, we're, we're always open-minded. We don't get too dogmatic with these, these rallies can happen at any time. But then we go back to our framework, and our framework suggests <laughs> the risk reward now mm -hmm. is pretty poor. Right, given our view on growth and, and given where rates are at this point. Mike, the new new, which you've been leading on, is a divide between service sector kind of equities and goods kind of equities. How sharp is the divide between Caterpillar and Apple Computer? Well, I mean, I think, it, I mean, you make a good point on the services versus goods, but you also make a point that there are different types of goods, uh, that some are uh, more expendable than others. And, you know, this is exactly why we've skewed ourselves more defensively, meaning we, we like companies that have things that you must buy or, need, you know, not not luxuries, but necessities, uh, things you need for everyday life. Uh, and and that's those are the kinds of stocks that have been doing well, because why? Because, you know, the volatility in their growth is not is not that volatile and they can deliver on the earnings during this period when uncertainty is going to be higher. And we're going to get a payback in demand for all these things that we over consumed in the last 12 to you know 24 months. And I think it's pretty obvious that that's what's playing out now. Mike, you've gotten the playbook so right this year, and you deserve a real congratulations for pinpointing where we are in the cycle and how we see rallies and then retracements. Where do you see the trade when it comes to energy at this point, given that it was one of the big calls in the first half of the year, the inflation protection at a time where now we're looking down growth fears really reigning supreme? Well, uh, those, those are nice comments, but energy is one area we completely botched. So, I mean, I'm not sure I'm the guy to ask, but Look, I mean, energy, we were not overweight enough. Uh, we own a few stocks in our portfolio, and we were, we were basically neutral. And, and I think that energy now is vulnerable uh, from an equity standpoint if, and this is a big if, if you take the view that a recession is sometime in the next 12 to 12, to 12 months. And it's just been our experience. And the thing I'm most worried about, Lisa, is that, you know, the commodity complex, uh, technically, and what it's telling us, it's not good. I mean, we're seeing demand destruction across the board. Some of that, you know, and some of the base metals and things like that is due to zero COVID policy in China, which could reverse in the fall potentially. But the charts don't lie. And they're telling me that we've seen a peak in commodities. And if we're going to have a recession, then they're probably going lower. So I would, we're, we're continuing to be neutral in energy. And quite frankly, I think people are probably a little bit too long at this point.
Mike, how much do you take the pushback that you, I'm sure you hear, which is that earnings have been better than expected. You see ongoing resilience. Yeah, there are potholes here and there, but for the most part, companies are, to use Tom's phrase, adjusting and adapting and moving forward. No, I mean, company, and U.S. companies are really good at managing earnings, okay? What they're not good at doing is forecasting earnings over the course of 12 months plus. Uh, that's been our experience, particularly at major turning points. And so you're right. They've done a good job of managing the quarters. And so what ends up happening is, that, you know, the bar gets lower. They jump over the lower bar. If I say it was better than expected. And then, you know, it's kind of a drip, drip, drip lower. You know, we, we do a pretty good job of forecasting 12, 24 months out macro, not at the micro level so much, but it, it informs us. And what we're seeing is that it's, this drip, drip, drip is going to continue for another two or three quarters. And there'll probably be more of a drop as opposed to a drip if it's a recession. So, look, I, I think the, in other words, what I'm saying is I think that don't get mesmerized by the very near term data on the on the earnings because you know these num these numbers are managed okay that's that's why they look they look better relative to the managed numbers and when you're looking out 12 months you just have to take your own view at, at these turning points you you can't rely necessarily on kind of what companies are saying or what the community is saying you need to take a view and our view is very clear the earnings revisions are going to be much more negative over the next two to three quarters than what we've seen for the last two years. And Mike, I've got to squeeze this in. What do you say to people getting mesmerized by the bond market move we've seen since the middle of June? Uh, well, that's one thing we've gotten right. We've been very bullish on bonds, as you know, John, uh, thinking that, you know, uh, the market's been a bit infatuated with, with inflation, of course, when it became obvious and the Fed. And that was really the story in Q1 and up until about May, June. At that point, we, you know, we think that was a time to pivot away from that and start thinking about, well, what's growth going to look like? So we think the bond rally makes perfect sense in the context of our fire and ice narrative. Uh, we're staying long, the long bonds, and uh, we think it's a great uh, hedge against the equity portfolio right now. Mike, awesome to get you on the show this morning. Thank you, sir. Mike Wilson there of Morgan Stanley, TK Bonds over equities over at Morgan Stanley right now. Well, it's a price up. Yield down seems to be the call. There's a lot of people that got that right. And, uh, again, the dynamics, when you look at the Bloomberg screen, folks, it's amazing to see some of these extensions, and particularly as a general statement, curve flattening. I love what Tim Thien over at Citibank uh, just said, John, on Caterpillar. He said, yeah, the earnings were there, but they were light. And I think that's what Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley's alluded to, is you can look at an earnings report and in the, in the view forward, and it's the quality or the conviction, the belief of what earnings will be. And there's one view of an important stock with earnings light. Elisa, do we see more of that in the second half of this year? And that's basically what we were hearing from Mike Wilson. I thought it was interesting what he said about energy, that he thinks probably people are too long because the charts don't lie, to use his words. And he sees a, a peak in commodity demand and a rolling over in this. This really goes to the heart of the uh, issue right now, which is that the only way for the Fed to combat supply-driven inflation is to crimp demand in tandem with how much supplies are down. And we don't know what that's going to do, but it's going to be bearish for a whole host of Industry. Simple way to frame it, isn't it? This Fed's going to keep responding to high inflation, and this market needs to focus on the damage done to growth in the meantime. Right. That seems to be the perspective of Mike and the team at the moment. Futures down <clears throat> six tenths of one percent on the S&P, yields lower by a couple of basis points on a ten-year to two fifty-five, and a focus on a plane heading to Taiwan, potentially landing in Taipei, with Speaker Pelosi on board. That landing could take place in around about two hours from now. We'll get the view from Peter Haynes of Pangea very shortly. From a beautiful New York City, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the press word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Nancy Pelosi is set to become the highest ranking American politician to visit Taiwan in 25 years and she's doing so in defiance of Chinese threats. The House Speaker is expected to land in Taiwan later today. China regards Taiwan as part of its own territory and the government has vowed there would be an unspecified military response to a Pelosi visit. President Biden says a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan has killed one of the planners of the 9-11 attacks. Ayman al-Zawahiri was the leader of al-Qaeda. According to a senior administration official, the drone attack had been planned for weeks. Zawahiri was in a house in Kabul and was said to have been killed when he stood out on a balcony. 
Three U.S. states have now declared a state of emergency in response to the monkeypox outbreak. California joined New York and Illinois in announcing the emergency. Their goal is to bolster vaccination efforts and stem the rise in infections. The three states account for almost half the roughly 6,000 monkeypox infections here in the U.S. And shares of Uber jumped this morning. The ride hailing company reported that second quarter revenue more than doubled, beating estimates. Meanwhile, Uber's gross bookings, which include passenger rides, food delivery and freight, rose 33% to an all-time high. And the pent-up demand for vacations is fueling a leisure travel boom. Hotel operator Marriott reported second quarter earnings that beat estimates. In June, the company's revenue per available room in the US and Canada was 3% higher than the same month in 2019. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. season is here. Everything yes. I've read has yes. just got the R word. Resilience, not recession. Earnings are expected to be so weak that I think that presents a very intriguing opportunity. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. We get a deluge of earnings globally this week from Alphabet and Microsoft. With exclusive expert analysis. These earnings have proved to be really inconsistent, not actually showing a real picture that goes one way or another. Bloomberg Television and Radio, the fastest numbers and analysis you trust. What I expect is just more ongoing in the weeks and months to come, just increasing pressure on Taiwan through cyber attacks, through political and economic pressure. And we'll see some of that in the terms of the U.S. as well, probably some fallout and diplomatic relations, which have actually remained relatively strong up until this point. Speaker Pelosi reportedly heading to Taiwan and potentially touching down in the next two hours. That was Julie Norman, the co-director of the UCL Center on U.S. Politics from New York City this morning. Good morning. Here's your equity market, a snapshot. It's defensive. Some risk aversion out there. Futures down six or seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down eight or nine tenths of one percent. No major moves here. Yields lower by a couple of basis points. A continuation of what you've seen over the last four days or so. Make it five now, Tom. Ten-year yeah. yields down for five straight sessions. The two. 55. John, thanks to Danny Lee for this. This is, folks, what 300,000 plus people are doing now. They're looking at flight radar on their phones and they're looking at SPAR 19. Possibly, this is the plane that Speaker Pelosi is on doing an end around the South China Sea you know that we can and see moving that, right? north. This uh, is no a one US can see Air this. Force plane. So, Tom, so this is going I, over Malaysia, over the Philippines. A, a, around the Philippines. Around the Philippines. And, and then it's going up to Taiwan. Taiwan. You can't see it. You can't but, see it at all, which is super that's useful. What John, that's seriously, radio. John, that's what 300,000 people are doing I noticed that this now, morning. Looking at an Air Force plane. I was doing the same thing this morning, Tom. Yeah. But I wasn't signed up. So apparently you only have a period of time on flight right now before they shut no, you down. I have, I, I, so I didn't sign up. I, no, well, when... With the Gulf Stream, I have to have it. Okay. I mean, so you're logged in and signed it. up to Flight Radar. Yeah, I am. You know, because when you're on the Gulf Stream, you got to know where you are. Right now, Terry Ains joins us, uh, founder of Pangea Policy. I've been looking forward to this all morning. Terry, I am absolutely fascinated by what the Newt Gingrich Republicans do with this trip. You and I sat on a couch in 1994, an absolute shock at what Gingrich and the GOP did you come for this many years, and the Republicans have to respond to this moment with the Democrat from San Francisco. How will they respond? Well, Tom, I think the uh, I think what you've had in uh, U.S. China, U.S. Taiwan policy for uh, for many years now, uh, and I would go back to the kind of the last couple of years of the Obama administration, is a great deal of bipartisanship. Uh, moving forward. Uh, you, you'll remember that throughout the entire Trump administration, uh, U.S.-China policy, U.S.-Taiwan policy was very unified. Uh, it continues to be unified. Uh, and I expect it to be unified going forward. Uh, going forward. Uh, this provides uh, the, the, this trip and uh, China's belligerence about it uh, also provides an opportunity for the United States, frankly, to continue to update its China policy. You know, we've had uh, 
the, the term always has been strategic ambiguity. Recently, we've had a lot of ambiguity, uh, and maybe the strategy has uh, has gotten lost a little bit. Uh, President unilaterally started talking about defending Taiwan. Uh, Speaker Pelosi's uh, trip is uh, is done certainly without the uh, full concurrence and public concurrence of the White House. Uh, and there's a lot of people in Congress uh, on a bipartisan basis again. Uh, Bob Menendez, Lindsey Graham, who are pushing forward to try to update uh, China and specifically Taiwan policy. And we'll see how Biden uh, gets involved in that and whether he does. Let's build on that. The, the, the areas of disagreement or the areas of agreement, where are the areas that you expect to see clarification in the U.S.'s China policy that you think will be significant for companies, for investors, and, and frankly, rank and file who are trying to understand what's going to happen? Well, let me start... Uh, Lisa, with the with the end, uh, I think there's there's been a great benefit in the strategic ambiguity policy of the United States, uh, but there's probably uh, some benefit in uh, in additional clarity here now too, and uh, and what I think uh, Senator Menendez, Senator Graham, and others are trying to do, frankly, is to start a debate. Uh, about exactly how to update China policy uh, with the idea that uh, more clarity from the United States is a good thing. So if there's additional clarity, I think that's probably good for markets because you have some idea what the guard, <clears throat> excuse me, some idea what the guardrails are, some idea of, uh, of uh, where the United States will go and where it won't. And, uh, and uh, China will understand that, and uh, and the idea is uh, maybe it will respond in kind, and uh, there will be more clarity uh, on both sides. So yeah. uh, that may end up being a good thing. Terry, the idea of possibly uh, lifting some of the tariffs on Chinese goods, is that basically off the table? I think it pretty much is, but <clears throat> excuse me, but whether or not it is, uh, markets should not look for uh, any kind of major moves on tariffs. The Biden people have been signaling that, firstly. Secondly, they've, they've taken a year and a half to get to a position where they're still studying it and may have, uh, you know, may have a decision in the near future. Uh, that is not something that augurs well for markets. Uh, thirdly, it's, it, it's uh, anything other than completely lifting tariffs doesn't provide any inflationary impact. So, uh, uh, so markets shouldn't look for that either. Terry, awesome to hear you and your perspective on this show. Going into an important event potentially later this morning. Terry Haynes there of Pangea Policy. And this is something we weren't really thinking about back in spring when Speaker Pelosi was first visiting. The major reason for the change is the change in the way China is talking about it. And Lisa, that's changed in a big way in the last couple of weeks. And it's not just talk. It's also the buildup in military. It's also uh, what we've seen in terms of clamping down on certain communications within the mainland of China. How much does China's change stance to force a change in U.S. policy? And that might be what's underscoring what Terry Haynes was talking about, this need to clarify the uh, strategic ambiguity into something a little more concrete in the U.S. It depends on the nature of the response from the Chinese government, Tom, a little bit later, if we do get a response a little bit later. To Lisa's point, if it takes an economic form, I go back to what Samson Ellis said about an hour ago, who said that ultimately this is going to hurt the people of Taiwan more than it hurts anyone here in America. Well, the, the distinction here is the calendar. And we all understand the cliche and maybe the reality that the Chinese have a long view. We started uh, the show talking about 2049 as a framework for President uh, Xi. But far more than that is the short term to get to the party congress in November. And this whole idea of it's a cliche, but it's true, saving face. How does President Xi react to this? is he's X number of days out to that party Congress. Well, clearly, Tom, he's doubling down on foreign policy and tension abroad at a time <laughs> where there's fragility at home, domestically. Well, fragility, I think, barely describes it, John. I think just the housing crisis, the Couldn't mortgage more. crisis alone. David Kirkpatrick, uh, David Fitzpatrick, Fickling, excuse me, David Fickling, with a superb essay today for Bloomberg Opinion. Is zero COVID becoming more controversial by the day? There's that, Tom. There's the uh, mortgage boycott you talk about. Disaster. There's the weakness in the economy. There are domestic issues we need to focus on. Futures down six tenths on the S&P. The bond market responds with yields lower three basis points, 253 and 92. John Riding coming up of Bring Capital. Looking forward to that next. This is Bloomberg.
Futures are negative. We're down six tenths of one percent from New York City this morning. Good morning. In about two hours from now, we're all waiting for the same thing to see if Speaker Pelosi lands in Taiwan and ultimately how will the Chinese respond to that. Going into it, futures are negative six tenths on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100 down eight tenths of one percent. Yields are lower by five basis points now. Two fifty, two sixty seven. Come on. What a move lower from 350-ish in the middle of June down to 252.49 at the start of August. A little bit later, we get the Fed speak. Daily, Evans, Mester, TK all coming up and a bit of data through this morning too. It's all coming up negative 32 basis points, two ten spread. I mean, the, the, the spread compression, John, is extraordinary. Just no unreal, TK. It. Never mind two's tens, <clears throat> three months versus tens, just all driven by this drop off right. in a 10 year yield over the last six weeks. We've got a lineup of things to talk about with a good John Riding, Chief Economic Advisor at Breen Capital. He joins us this morning. It'd be the Tots starting out their season, what AC Milan is going to do, and of course, his Preston North End playing. Is it Wigan or Wigan? Wigan? We, we Wigan. played Wigan Athletic, Wigan. the Latics, and drew. An uninspiring performance, nothing, nothing. Very good. That's our soccer talk for today, just because there's so much going on. I want you to talk, John, writing right now about the Phillips curve, this ancient thing from another time, and it has to do with the time of Beveridge, the economist at LSE. And I want you to link in the Phillips curve myth with the raging debate over the Beveridge curve and the efficiency of our labor economy. Well, first of all, <clears throat> I was born in the same year that uh, uh, Professor Phillips penned his article uh, on the Phillips curve, so that makes me an ancient thing from another time as well. Um, and uh, th that, that curve was, was really a description of the behavior of the labor market over a period of 100 years or so. And it, it was hijacked um, by people like Paul Samuelson uh, and Solo in, in the U.S. to make it a, a theory of inflation. And Milton Friedman in 1968 said, well, it's, it's not. It's not going to be stable. And he, that was a very prescient article because what he said is workers will factor in the higher prices eventually to the wage bargain and they will add more and the Phillips curve will break down. That's exactly what it did in the 1970s. But now we're back in an environment where for the last 20 years or so, inflation was so low that nobody took it into account. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the Phillips curve reemerged. And now um, the question is, how much unemployment do policymakers think they are going to have to engineer? Can they uh, engineer it? That's the heart of well, the matter, John, is, is can any central bank, whether in the United Kingdom or the U.S., engineer a labor economy? Well, here's the problem. They want to create some slack. And that Phillips curve thinking is very clear at the Fed right now. They want to create some slack in the economy without causing a recession, which means growth has to be between potential growth, which they think is around 1.8%, 1.9% per year, and zero. Otherwise, the economy is in recession. Now, let's just clear up. The economy is not in recession uh, at, at the present time. The economy created 2.7 million jobs We got an, in the first half of this year. We got another jobs report on Friday. But as Powell said, it's a very narrow path. And if the Fed's going to make a mistake, given that it's let inflation out for the first time in three decades, it's going to make a mistake by raising rates too much. And that inevitably uh, is going to result at some point uh, in recession, not imminently, but as the three-month, 10-year curve flattens, uh, that recession signal starts to emerge when we, when we get close to zero a, a year out. So I think emer you know, engineering a soft landing and this latest debate, the beverage curve, the relationship between vacancies and unemployment, we get the jolts data, the job openings data later today, which gives us a new reading on job openings. There are almost two jobs per unemployed person. This debate going on right now is, can the Fed deflate the demand for labor in the economy without pushing up unemployment a lot because there's a lot of job openings. Uh, and, and, you know, there's quite a, a, a raging debate going on between Governor Waller on the one hand and Larry Summers yeah. on the other hand, yeah. trading blows. Uh, Waller gave a speech yeah. on Friday and uh, Summers well, and Blanchard let, published let's a, a explain. Lisa, yesterday. jump in here on this huge debate about engineering <laughs> forward. Yeah, basically saying that uh, Waller's soft landing paper had errors after uh, Chris Waller came out and tried to slap down uh, their previous 
serious piece. So basically a tit for tat in academic journals. The other big debate is how far the Fed will have to go to engineer some sort of softening in the labor market, what it will take. And you have some people saying we're close to the terminal rate perhaps even Fed Chair Jay Powell uh, hinting at that. And then you have the likes of Zoltan Pozar over at Credit Suisse saying, more likely we have to get to 5 to 6% because of how entrenched some of these inflationary aspects are. Where do you stand? Well, Lisa, as you know, all through last year, I was warning you that inflation was going to be the problem. And when we discussed the Fed making a mistake, we discussed the Fed doing too little in 2021, not too much in 2022. Now, what the Fed has to do now is a consequence of the mistake they made last year by continuing to ease, continuing to buy assets all through last year as inflation picked up. So I, I don't think Powell's signaling that what the market's reading right now, which is the Fed's not going to raise rates as much as they said, he was signaling very much the best guidance we can give you, to the extent we can give you guidance, is the forecast we gave you, the so-called SEPs in, in June, which was 3.4% at the end of this year, 3.8% yeah. at the end of next year. Now, with two yields, we're <clears throat> almost talking about them, it's a long way away from, from that guidance. So from June... Where the markets are priced in an interest rate above inflation of about three quarters of a point on average for the next 10 years, it's just about taking out that so-called positive real interest rate and that tightening in the economy and yet not really factor back in inflation. And I think that's too easy a choice. Either the Fed is going to have to hike rates and get policy restrictive, and that's higher than the markets currently think, or we are going to have a more protracted inflation problem. And right now, I don't think the markets are lined up in a sensible manner of having right. relatively low inflation break-evens and a relatively low terminal rate, given the not only the U.S., but the global scope uh, of this inflation problem. John, throw into the mix what we're seeing right now with uh, Nancy Pelosi expected to land in Taiwan in about two hours. This question of whether the safety bid is to go into sh short-term treasuries or even treasuries at all, if uh, that could potentially increase inflation and if the Fed is still going to try to fight what the market is assuming in terms of a pivot. How do you see the response going forward? to this type of risk? Look, I, I think the Fed has made it clear <clears throat> that beating inflation is job one and probably job two, and then other things come after that at the present time. And the luxury that the Fed has had in the past to respond to geopolitical events like, for example, Brexit, um, and to respond to <clears throat> market events uh, and to respond to right. the unemployment rate and so on was because inflation was so low. Now we have inflation that in CPI terms is 9.1%. While the July number will probably show a bit of relief because of the decline in gas prices, it's by no means assured that we've even seen the peak uh, in I mean, inflation yet. And John, what's so important, John Farrow, is thinking of University of Warwick and Robert Skidelsky, we've got people doing political economics like Lord Skidelsky, and at the same time we're talking about engineering the economy is if there's any evidence we can engineer an economy. I find that insane. And Tom, I'd go a step further. There's clearly some policy bias here, some political bias, which is shaping some of the yes. analysis yeah, taking fair. place at the moment, John, which I think we all find inc increasingly frustrating. The simple way to frame this is soft landing versus hard landing. John, which camp are you in? Ultimately, if you had to choose a side right now. I, I think ultimately it has to be a, a hard landing. The, uh, the runway is just too short to uh, carry on with the uh, uh, airplane analogy uh, to, to bring this down on a, on a soft landing, given how <laughs> narrow the gap is between a potential recession uh, and, uh, and growth at the economy's economic potential. Uh, and it, it's not that the Fed tightening causes the inflation as such. What it is is when the public's expectations of inflation are built in sufficiently, that those expectations are inconsistent with the <clears throat> policy tightening. Now, the one good piece of news that the Fed has is that the 10-year inflation expectations from U.S. households, from the University of Michigan, is at 2.8%. Now, we don't know how good a survey that is. It's only 500 people, and, and it was at 3.3% in June, and I don't believe long-term expectations bounce around uh, uh, as much as they do. But that's the key thing. If the public believe the inflation increase is going to be transitory, then I think the debate 
we should be framed between is it going to be a mild recession when it eventually comes, probably late 23, 24? Is it going to be a mild recession or is it going to be a deeper recession? And that's the key thing. We have to watch inflation expectations because the more entrenched inflation expectations are, the deeper the recession is, is the public's beliefs about how the economy is going to unfold and the Fed's intention of what it's going to do about the inflation rate come into conflict. You know what I'd love to do? Just listen in to the UMich survey being conducted in real time and see what people say on the phone calls. Tom, can you imagine? Where do you think inflation is going to be in five to ten years? And how people I, respond I, on I've the phone never call when they receive it. Them. Have they ever called you, John Farrell? They've, they've never they've called never me. They've never called me. They've never they called you. They call Lisa about every three months. So they call Lisa. <laughs> Lisa's anchoring that number much, much higher. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they're a go-to. No, I've never been, I've never been surveyed. John, either. how much time do we have with writing? Come and on, we've got, got to talk got Premier 30, League. You can have 30 seconds, Premier Tom. League. I mean, John, who looks good in the pre John writing, who looks good in the Premier League? Well, Community Shield, Liverpool 3, Manchester City 1, so... I think those of us uh, Liverpool fans have thought, well, it's going to be probably going to be city season with the with the upgrade. Uh, there we go. Uh, I think uh, Liverpool is going to give them a real run for the money again, down to the last weekend. There we go. We begin the season. Premier League coverage, team coverage, Bloomberg surveillance with John Wright. The season kicking off this weekend. John Wright yes. of Bring Capital. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Futures are down by seven tenths of one percent in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. I'll catch up with Colin Martin and Charles Schwab, Gene Tanusa of Columbia Thread and Needle, and Victoria Green of G Squared Private Wealth. As we wait to see if Speaker Pelosi touches down in Taiwan. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word on Ritika Gupta. Threats by China don't appear to be deterring House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Later today, she's expected to become the highest ranking U.S. politician in 25 years to visit Taiwan. China has vowed an unspecified military response. Beijing regards Taiwan as part of its own territory. The U.S. calls him a longtime terrorist leader who helped plan the 9-11 attacks. Now, President Biden says the leader of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, has been killed in Afghanistan by a U.S. drone strike. In a statement at the White House, the president said, quote, justice has been delivered. In Russia, American basketball star Brittany Griner was back in court after her trial for cannabis possession. Closing arguments are set for Thursday. If convicted, she could face 10 years in prison. The White House says that Russia has made a bad faith response to a U.S. offer that reportedly calls for Griner and other jailed Americans to be exchanged for a Russian arms deal. Toronto Dominion is building up its presence in American capital markets just months after agreeing to expand retail operations in the U.S. Canada's second largest bank has agreed to buy U.S. brokerage Cowan for $1.3 billion in cash. Cowan is based in New York and has 1,700 employees. And JetBlue got hammered by soaring fuel costs in the second quarter. The airline reported a wider than expected loss. Total cost rose 89 percent. Jet JetBlue says it's starting a new cost reduction program that should deliver savings of $250 million a year by 2024. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. price in the same Fed that we had in 2018. You can't price the same reaction function. At the first sign of weakness, and we're already seeing that, the Fed's not going to be able to come in and ride to the rescue with rate cuts with the same speed and flexibility that they would have when we have inflation at 2%. Hello, Raim. Exceptionally sharp there. Chief U.S. Economist, FS Investments. Enjoyed that discussion uh, immensely there. Just the, 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 the swirl's the right word, the swirl that is out there. We're also, of course, monitoring here roughly an hour and a half, I will say, from perhaps a Pelosi historic moment in Taiwan. Right now, our chart of the day, Kriti Gupta. Kriti, what do you have? A chart of the day that talks about the financial implications of this trip to Taiwan specifically. We're looking at a little bit of a wonky chart, Tom. Stick with me here. It's the Taiwan TIEX Shipping and Transportation Index. Basically, it's an index that measures the returns of the transportation sector that is specifically exposed to the Taiwan Strait. Now, for those of our audience that isn't familiar, the Taiwan Strait <clears throat> is, of course, between the United States and China. 88% of the world. I world's swim at once. <laughs> 
and excelled. It was he made great time. 88% of the world's largest ships by tonnage go through here. So it's really a, a shipping channel, a supply chain Very channel cool. that never recovered. We're looking at a chart that goes back about two years, and you kind of see the stagnation in those shipping rates. For anyone who remembers my copper gold chart <laughs> yesterday, the line looks very similar. But then starting by about a month ago, this index drops, and it really comes among these heightened Very Taiwan cool. tensions. The idea here being that if you start to see military action, there is yeah. a very real financial cost. All you need to know on radio is pretty normal chart about two months ago, three months ago, off a cliff. Pretty good to thank you so much. Greatly appreciate that. Right now, one B. Ritholtz joins us, Barry Ritholtz, with his wonderful podcast and, of course, his writing and his management of money as well. Barry, I want to talk to you about the enthusiasm of not annualizing and that we get a NASDAQ pop up 16% off the bottom and we can annualize it out in our head, which none of us talk about, but we do constantly. 242% annual return off this lift off. How do you behaviorally manage ownership of equities when you get a pop like that, but you got to invest for long term? Well, I hate the annualized approach Thank because you. it lacks, lacks context. Up 16%, just zoom out a little bit and say off of down 33%. So maybe we've made up almost half of the losses. How, okay, so now annualize where we are year to date. It's not great. So you have to recognize that the flip side of, of reward is risk and that markets go up and down. I think 2021 made a lot of people, especially some of the newbie Robinhood traders and the Reddit Wall Street Bets yeah, group, like Lisa. Think that it's easy. Just buy a stock and uh, that's going up and sell it when it stops. You know, Will Rogers uh, told you if it doesn't go up, don't buy it. You know, I look very at where Lisa jump in here. I think this is so important. There's, you know, the, the different opinions, Lisa, that we've yeah. gotten here on the equity market is just it's a jumble. Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, it's easy. Just buy an oil barrel when it's hot and then or when it's uh, zero and, and sell it when it's uh, when it's hot. Yes, no, in all honesty, <laughs> we're looking at a real washout in some capacities, in some corner. We've seen that. And I'm wondering how much that's going to factor into what happens next, Barry, especially some of the less liquid aspects of the market. I'm thinking of private equity that hasn't yet been written down. And then you get the likes of Jewel suddenly, where we see that the big asset managers have written it down by 88 uh, percent due to an investigation, but it really reflects some of the angst that hasn't been tracked in markets that are less visible. Half the appeal of alternatives, and, and it, this includes venture capital, private equity, even farmlands, is you don't get a print every microsecond. You get a quarterly audit for some percentage of the holding. So over the course of the year, everything is updated. But that lack of daily you know, price swings, and it's the same thing with the house you live in. You don't get a print every morning, every hour, every day. And so you don't really pay attention to price swings. They're not relevant until you're selling. And, and you know, there's a well-understood concept of an illiquidity premium. Since you don't need daily liquidity, you're going to theoretically get a better return for some of these alternatives. And the good news is, you don't see these prints all the time. The bad news is when they actually mark them to market, uh, and the typical fund will do about 25% of their holdings each quarter. So every year uh, they've they've audited their entire book. You get a once a year print, and sometimes in a year like this year, you see a, a, a big markdown. I don't know about 88% of well, course that was, all the private equity. That, that was idiosyncratic. But, <laughs> that was a specific right, issue but, having to do with the investigation. But the point here, Barry, and I, I just want to highlight this in the little time that we have left. When somebody's trying to arrange a portfolio a year ago, two years ago, liquid was better. Go into private equity, go into alternatives. That's what everyone was saying in order to get extra alpha at a time when the world was soaring. Is that changing? Are people saying an index fund with liquidity is better and perhaps less liquid asset classes have more hair on them because of the lack of visibility and the lack of easy to easy exit? So I'm reminded of, of the words of the great investor Groucho Marx, who said, I don't want to be a member of any club that would have me. And to some degree, when we look at alternatives, and, and that's everything from venture to hedge fund to private equity, the ones you can get in easily want your money, need your money, are very happy to take your money, 
tend not to be the top performing funds. If you have a billion dollars and you're well connected, yeah, okay. hey, I can make a few phone calls and get you into the top decile of alts. But most investors don't have access to that. And so you end up in a circumstance where you can't treat the universe of alts like you can the market for stocks or bonds. You you end up with a very, you know, right. fat head, long tail of a handful of alpha generators and then a whole lot of expensive underperformers. Barry, got to leave it there because we've got to look forward to Speaker Pelosi's travels in the Pacific. Barry Riddle, thank you so much. Masters of Business there on an equity market that's confusing. Lisa, quickly on the market to see 210 spread now printing a true negative 32 basis points is my lead for the day. That's in a stunning, stunning 100, uh, 158. Well, and it's led by the long end. People are piling into longer-term treasuries yeah, three, in the face of uncertainty. Points, yeah. A faith in the Fed, and I go back to what Mike Wilson's belief is, that this faith in the Fed will be good for bonds, but not so much for stocks going forward because mm -hmm. it hints at that slowdown that a lot of people are starting to talk about and that's being priced in, right. certainly, uh, to the front end in terms of a Fed response. I, I, I thought the interview of the day, uh, uh, Lisa, and, and all that we've covered here was Samson Ellis out of Taipei, our wonderful bureau chief there. He speaks like eight forms of Mandarin, exceptionally knowledgeable. And I don't know what to make of his comment that Taiwan's like, well, you know, okay, Speaker Pelosi's coming, you know, great. Yeah, and that they I don't know what to make of it. didn't ask for it, and they're not, they don't seem that concerned in terms yeah. of China's potential retaliation. And at the same time, you know, the threat of the economic ramifications is significant for a, 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 an island that does you depend know. on China and their economic uh, exports. We will see. We, like a lot of other people, are monitoring a plane that perhaps Speaker Pelosi's on. It is east of Manila, moving north. We'll have coverage of this, of course, into the 10 o'clock hour on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Please stay with us. Futures negative 28. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.